um, page 327, number 13. And what was the eigenvalue for that, Michelle? I had one half. One half, okay. And then you had a vector. Oh, yep. Sorry, sorry. It's actually negative one. Okay, negative one. All right, there we go. Okay, so you had a problem where you said your eigenspace was equal to the span of this vector. And in the back of the book, it says the eigenspace is equal to the span of this vector, right? So wh what were you thinking? So you're, you're worried about, does the factor of two, because these are related by a factor of two, does it make a difference, right? Correct. Okay. So let me ask you a question about that, Michelle. What does the span of one vector look like? What would be the vectors that make up the span, right? That's a set of vectors. How would you characterize those set of vectors? Right, because when I write down the span of this vector, what, what, it means a set of vectors. What do those set of vectors look like? Like, give me five vectors from there. How, how would you do that? Yeah, yeah, Mich Michelle, are you I'm just trying to, because, yep. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what you're wanting. Would it just be yep. like any multiple of that span? Mm -hmm. Of that vector. Or yeah, of the vector. Right, right, because the span is not just this single vector and the word span in front, right? I mean, what it means is any linear combination of these vectors here. So, for example, the span is all those vectors such that the vector equals a multiple of one half minus one half one. All right, so when you write down the span of something, you're not talking one vector. You're talking an infinite number of vectors and any multiples of those. Okay, does that make sense, Michelle? Yes. Okay, so that the question I was asking is, is you know, if you give me some, um, uh, what I'm asking is, if you write it like this, it seems a bit, the problem is, and this is where I think you're getting caught, um, is that when you write down the span of this one vector, in your mind, you're probably thinking that's one vector. You know what I mean? Sometimes notation can be helpful, and then sometimes it can actually make you think the wrong thing. So what I did here is write it out as what the set looks like. So let's do the same for what, you, what the back of the book had as their answer. So this is saying all these vectors y, such that y equals r times 1 minus 1, 2, something like that. So let me ask you a question, Michelle. Do you think these two sets are the same or different? And if so, why? I would say the same. Great, right? Because the deal is, well, actually, let's call this S, for example, right? The only difference between these is they're just multiples of this, this vector. So up to a scale factor, it doesn't make any difference. You're going to have the same set of vectors because if you look here, if I said S, is equal to one half r, then then this s here would be one half r one minus one two, and this would be r one half minus one half one, and isn't that the same as that? Okay. So in other words, um, ho does that hopefully answer your question? Yeah, I just didn't know which form you preferred. Oh, okay. I don't. I don't. What happens there is that's one of those jobs where when I look at the answer, I have to figure out whether it's a scalar multiple of the answer that I have. <laughs> so yes, you're, e either one is fine. But, but I think it's a good question, and I think it's just a generally relevant question for everybody to really appreciate that this span thing, it looks like it's only one vector, but it's an infinite number of vectors. Okay? So good question, Michelle. Thank you. Do you have another one there this morning, or is that the primary one you were after? Yeah, Michelle here had the same question as well. <coughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, w what you're worried about with respect to order. Can you kind of go through and, because uh, I, th I try to answer Michelle's question here about that via email, and I don't know if I actually did answer it or not. I think so. Okay, I'm can you? Uh, I'm confused about it too. 
Okay, good. Okay, so uh, Michelle, remotely, why don't you ask the question and then we'll see if Michelle in Fayette has the same kind of question and then we'll try to answer that. So Michelle, yeah, what's your, what's your question then regarding the order? So, you, you, okay, I'm just trying to understand what that means. So I've got V1, V2, V3, and each one of them gives you, is an eigenvector like that? Is that what you're saying, Michelle? Well, when you find your result, does it matter which one applies to the one, two, or three? Okay, um, th now this is where I'm having a problem understanding. What do you mean by result? Yep. Vectors, um, when you get the multiplication like um, plus 3 minus 2 equals 0, when you find eigenvector 1 is equal to negative 3 and 2 is equal to 2, does it matter? Can, can you give me a specific um, example? I'm, I'm really struggling to understand it, Michelle. So uh, can you give me an example? Can you give me something to look at? And I'll, I'll, I'm not following. Well, I was working on yep. page 340, number 7. Okay. Three forty number seven. Okay. Three forty number seven. Three forty number seven. So this one here, Michelle. Is that the one you had to um That is correct. Okay. Okay. So here's your A. And Michelle here is saying that's the same problem that, that this, the problem she was asking about too. Okay, so uh, can you, do you have it up there on the screen? Is that what you have right now? Okay, hold on a sec. Yeah, I have to the point that I can get it done. Okay, very good. Let me have a look at this. I'm going to show everybody this, what you've got there, so I can have a look. So you go through and you find out you have two eigen, oh, okay, so... Michelle, the first thing is, you see that where you've got lambda 1 is equal to minus 3 and lambda 2 is equal to 2? Correct. Okay, you've called them eigenvectors. They're not eigenvectors, they're eigenvalues. Good. Excellent. Okay. All right. Now, okay, good. I've got the eigenvectors. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Here we go. I'm making mistake myself, sorry about that. I've got the eigenvalues, all right. Then I go through and I solve for the kernel of the eigenspace, gotcha. All righty. And you put that together and you end up with E of minus three is minus one, one, gotcha. And then... Now in the back of the book it has one, negative one, so maybe I made an error somewhere. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Good question. So we found that, now Michelle, you called lambda 1 minus 3 and lambda 2, was it plus 1? Is that, is that right? Yes. Okay. And then you went through and you found out the <coughs> eigenspace of minus 3 and you found out that that was equal to the span of, what do you say, 1 minus 1? Whoop, the other way around, sorry. Minus 1, 1 like that. Oh, sorry, you can't see me. Sorry about that. You, this is where you're at right now, right? Yes. Okay. Now, apparently the back of the book says that for this eigenvalue, it's equal to the span of plus one, minus one, right? <coughs> and you're worried that something went wrong. Yes. Okay. Let me ask you a question, Michelle. Based on the discussion that we just had, What do you think about, do you think this is a problem? No. Okay, good. All right. That's the problem with the back of the book. <laughs> is the, ba the back of the book, I, I don't know if you found this, but I think, as I, I've never used this book before, but what we're finding is that sometimes the answers in the back of the book actually cause you more consternation than if you just didn't know the answer. 
Um, right? Probably, Michelle, that was really bothering you, right? Yes. Right, right, yeah. So, does that probably answer your question now, or do you still have an order question? No, I'm finding that order does not matter. Because when you were talking about order, not oh, because what's the um, eigenvector associated with lambda two? What do you get for that eigenvector? Do you have that one? Four one. Four one. Okay. So when you were talking about order, it was mainly the plus and the minus. Was that the deal on the one? Yes. Okay. All right. So I think we got that one sorted out. Yeah. Be careful. I mean, uh, just a general comment there is <laughs> the, the problem is right. The span of minus one one and the span of plus one minus one are actually the same thing because these are just different by a scalar multiple. Anytime they're different by just a number multiplying them, they're actually the same span because r times minus one plus one, all of those vectors is exactly the same as this. And the relationship between the r and the s is just one is the negative of the other. So it's actually the same set. And yeah, th th that's a real problem. Um, actually in other linear algebra books, it's even worse than we've experienced in this book because what happens in other books is the, you know this thing R ref of A? That is unique. So when the back of the book says this is what it is, you have to get it. If you don't get it, it doesn't work. But in a lot of other books, they actually don't go all the way to do R ref. They just do this ref thing. That is not unique. And you can come up with any answer you want. And then we had a nightmare of problems in other books when I've done this. Because people would look in the back of the book and they're like, oh, I've got it wrong. I'm not sure what's going on. And actually, everything is good. So yeah, I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say is with the back of the book, um, I think you should look at it and say, OK, I've got a question. And then you know, send me a question or ask in this session about it. Because it is really hard to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, OK, I do. Th thank you, Michelle. But uh, sure, yeah, why don't you bring it up? OK. Uh, but I, I trust me, I, I, I understand what you're saying with the back of the book. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how to get around it because technically everybody's right. Cut the <coughs> Sorry? Cut the, book. <laughs> uh, cut the answers out of the book. Uh, well, <laughs> they probably are more help than not, I guess, at the end of the day. Okay. I, it was the same question. I just, when I set up my S, compared mm -hmm. to the answer in the back of the book again, I set it up this way, and to get the right answer, you have to set it up this way, so I didn't know if it mattered what you designated as V1 and V2, and I'm assuming it does. Otherwise, you'll have your S matrix backwards. Oh. But I didn't know how you'd choose what oh. even okay. value is which. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So well, it does matter because sometimes it wouldn't have an inverse then or something, right? Oh. Oh. That hopefully won't be the case. If that's true, then we've got real, yeah. <laughs> okay, then, then we have real, yeah, yeah, okay. In other w words, I guess my, I, I want to be very careful about what I say, so I won't say it, because I was about to say <laughs> order doesn't matter. Order doesn't matter in terms of your overall result, but order will matter in terms of what your S looks like. Right. Okay, so that, that's, so I want to say order does and doesn't matter. Okay. Okay, depending on what your question is, all right? So now that I've confused everybody, let me, let me go through it. Because let me just write down for this particular A, right? We ended up with, what, what was your A here? Uh, yeah. 1, 4, 1, minus 2. And I just remind everybody, this is page 340. Oh, and by the way, I'm trying to uh, record some of these sessions. And um, the, uh, some of the problems that I've gone through are actually up on the, uh, are, I'll show you everybody a little bit later. They're up on the UIU YouTube page, so uh, you can kind of go there and have a look. Um, th there are problems from early on in the class, so I don't know how relevant they'll be, but I just wanted to let you know the things that I have recorded are there as well. Okay. Um, so let's just go through this, and yeah, okay, good, Michelle, you're good with us. Okay, so what we've ended up with is I'm going to call lambda one, what did you call lambda one here, Michelle? Uh, negative three. Negative oh. three, yep. Yeah. Okay, and V1 then came out to be 
Uh, so let's just say V1 is the eigenvector, and what is it, 1? You, you had mine? Okay. And then lambda 2 is equal to... You got plus 2? Yeah. Plus 2. Okay. So actually, I guess my first question is, Michelle and Cardin, did you, um, did you get the same eigenvalues? Oh, okay, good. So V2 is equal to, and what do we say there? 4, 1? Yep. Okay. So now the question was, you made your S by doing V1, V2. Mm -hmm. Right? And I'm guessing in the back of the book, they made their S by doing V2, V1. Is that? Yeah, or whatever. I mean. Right. Right. So, and that's why they got different answers than what you got. It didn't matter. Oh, okay. It's it's fine because you see they will have an s of four one minus one one, and you will have an s of where we go minus one one four one something like that, mm -hmm. right? So your s inverse is going to be different from their s inverse. Right. Well, I did it both ways, I guess. Okay, you did it both ways, and so you get one fifth. Minus one, four, one, one, and then when you do it the other way, you get one fifth, one, one minus one, four, something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, and then what did you have to find the diagonal? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, what you should get is with the diagonal. I, I, because we've done it with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I know where the answer should, how it should look. And the answer should look like the eigenvector of your first one is here. Mm -hmm. So it should be lambda 1, lambda 2, okay. which will be minus 3, 2. Mm -hmm. Whereas over here, the diagonal should be, here you've got the lambda mm -hmm. of V2 first. So that should be lambda 2, lambda 1. So that should be uh, 2 minus 3, 0, 0. And I think what you were saying is, you were disturbed that when you went through both ways, you got diagonals that are different, I see, but it, it, it's okay as long as you're consistent okay. with where you put, if you're, if whatever this eigenvalue is first, that's the first eigenvalue. Okay. So as long wrong as you way get way. a diagonal, it doesn't matter. That's right, how that's go. right, okay. that's right. That's what I was worried about. Yeah, yeah, no, I can, I can appreciate that. That's a, I, I guess what you're showing is order doesn't matter when you put it in here, but once you've determined it there, it sets what you're going to have down here. So if you had like um, an a to the t power? Yes. So then you would end up with the same answer if you went through and? Yes. Okay. Good like question. Raise both ones to the power? Um, <coughs> which I don't. Actually, that's a good question. I don't think I thought about that. Oh, yeah. No, that's okay. Actually, you will end up with the same answer. Let me say why. Okay. okay. Uh, Michelle's asked a really good question here, which is, um, Somehow it doesn't seem like you're going to end up with the same answer. No, it doesn't. Okay. Because, and I think what you're thinking, Michelle, is the following. A to the T, you're thinking it's D to the T, which is then mm -hmm. minus 3, zero, zero, 2 to the T, which is then going to be minus 3 to the T, 0, 0, 2 to the T. Whereas over here, A to the T would be mm -hmm. D to the T, which would be 2, 0, 0, minus 3 to the T, and 2 to the T, 0 to the T, which is 0, sorry, 0 minus 3 to the t, and then somehow, I mean, this is saying somehow the first component is minus 3 to the t, and this is saying the first component is 2 to the t, so somehow something funny is going on. Mm -hmm. But that's yeah, not the, the formula. Right. The thing is, isn't it, is it S inverse in the front? Yeah. Okay, and the S there? Mm -hmm. Well, what happens is notice how the S and the S inverse are different mm -hmm. here and different. These S inverses, these are different, and the S's here are different, that will compensate for this and mix them around and give you the same answers for your component. You can try it. It's very disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. The, the, well, actually, can you can you try it though? Just yeah. I mean, can, I mean, put it this way. I haven't actually done this. I act on faith of <laughs> of what has been done. That that um, a, and so uh, now that you've got it like that, can you just go through and convince yourself that? Actually, when you do A to the T and then you put the S inverses and S's in there, you actually really do get the same answer on each side. That's my claim. Mm -hmm. If not, me and I have to think about it. <laughs> well, it seems like it would make sense since they're different. That's right. That's right. And so. That's what we don't think about, I guess. 
Yeah. Yeah. So give that a shot and see how that works. All right. Okay. That, that's an excellent question, by the way. That really is, um, it, it's really good. And, and it's kind of, this is nice because this is kind of like um, investigative math because what you're doing is you're sitting looking at something and saying, hey, this just doesn't make sense. And then what you've got to be, and, and you're absolutely right, it doesn't make sense if, if you're thinking A to the T is D to the T, but it's these other guys, the fact that they're different, I bet you it's going to give you your answer. Right. Okay? So give that a shot, see how you go. Good question. And it uh, reminds me to, I think maybe in my videos, I, it would be actually a good thing to go through to show these, illustrate these differences, because I think it's a very confusing point. Well, that's what I kept thinking. If I'd rem if I'd knew, uh, you know, it, yeah. The, the the thing is, uh, it it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I didn't worry about it, mm -hmm. but I can now see how it's very confusing. Mm -hmm. and, and what happens is we just keep thinking, and I tend to say this a lot: that a of t is just d of t, mm -hmm. but it's not quite, and it's the not quite that makes the difference. Okay. Mm All right. Good. Good question. All righty. So now, uh, I believe I'm ready for the test. You're ready there, Dawn? Okay, now, the only thing is, Dawn, I haven't had a chance to look through your uh, problem set four that you sent me yesterday. Uh, is that going to be a problem? Do you want me to try to get that done in the next 20 minutes or so and then get that back to you, or how do you want to do that? I think I want to go ahead and just take the test. Um, okay. Did that come out okay? Was it blurry at all? Uh, which, the problem set four? Right. I haven't had a chance to open the email, so I actually don't know, Dawn. Um, do you want me to okay, I looked at it and it seemed to be okay, but um, yesterday I was actually at a, at a workshop, the ARC workshop in Owine, and we received a video camera. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I took video of it and then I took pictures and sent it that way since I wasn't around a scanner. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just uh, open up the computer and get going on, on try that. Um, what kind of camera did you get? Was it just a webcam? What? I'm showing it to you right now. It's yeah. um, flip video. So oh. I'm actually taking video of the lecture right now. Oh, okay. So I don't miss anything. Okay, interesting. Good. Okay. And so you, you put it on there, um, Dawn, and then you... Um, is that like a camera recorder? Is that what that is? Yes. Okay. It takes up to two hours, and so I just um, looked at my video of my um, assignment, and then I took pictures of each page mm -hmm. and attached it and sent it. Okay, cool. I'll have a look at that and see if that works for you. Um, that's interesting. It's called flip video. So it's like basically a digital hand recorder, except it has video as well, right? Okay, gotcha. Right. Cool. Um, now, okay, so if you're ready there for your test, uh, if you can just, can you go and sit at your teacher station there for me? And then we'll flick to the overhead. Yes. Okay, thanks, Dawn. Good, and then there should be an overhead button there somewhere. Okay, good. Now, could you span, scan out a bit, please? That would be zoom out, I guess. Okay, that's good. Now, do you have a piece of some paper there for yourself?
Okay, Dawn. All right, good. So I'm going to, um, sorry about that, I'm going to send that fax through to you right now. And if you have any questions, let me know. When you're all set there? Yep. All right, good luck. If you've got any questions, let me know. Okay, Rick, how you doing there? Um, I'm struggling to find the eigenvalues when we've got decimals. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, what problem is that one, Rick? This is H329 number 41. It's the um, population of the goats one, like example five, the, or uh, another example of that one. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. <coughs> Excuse me. First, I'm just trying to make sure I did this correctly, but I came, got this here, and now I'm trying to get from here to eigenvalues. Okay, all right, let me bring that up on a screen here. Um, okay, right, so you got your, yeah, you got your thing there. Uh, and what you're trying to do is solve that cubic, right? Is that the, is that the problem there, Rick? Yeah, I'm struggling to remember how to do this with the decimals here. Oh, okay. Um, I guess how I would do it is, uh, <laughs> this is a place where I think you have a couple of options. Um, you can guess and plug and chug and see if you get the right answer. Uh, Kim, how did you get the right answer in this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's right where I am. Okay, so Kim is saying, yeah, if you can just, yep. Yeah. Kim, do you want to just hit the? I'm in the same class that you are. Okay. So, yeah, so we're kind of stuck on this one here, right? And, and the, the yep. okay, and, 
I'm just writing this one down. Uh, over here, all right, so this is really our problem. We don't know how to solve this one here, okay? Uh, what does the back of the book tell us? Does it tell us anything? Like what the eigenvalues are? Yeah. They've got one and two tenths, negative eight tenths, and negative four tenths. Negative eight tenths and negative four tenths. Okay. What I would do in a problem like this is, in essence, this is where with decimals, you're stuck. You're not going to know how to figure this one out, right? I mean, some of these are hard enough as it is with just integers. You see, if you have everything as integers, 2 lambda plus 3, this you have a chance of figuring out by factorizing this. 3 times 1, and you can guess it. You know, the, the eigenvalue guesses could be plus or minus 3 or plus or minus 1. That's how you can potentially find out what solved this. You plug and chug and guess. Well, good luck factorizing that one, right? I mean, that, that's, you know. So uh, at this stage, you kind of throw your hands up in the air, and um, there's kind of a couple approaches. And this is actually why I chose this one to be an odd answer. There's two approaches that I would take. Uh, probably the, the best approach to take is to basically put it into some technology and get it to solve it. Or, and, and by that, what I mean is probably put it into a graphing calculator and find and plot this function. Whoopsie daisy. Plot this function on your graphing calculator and find out where the roots are. You can do that with yours, yep. Okay, if it's, if it's decimals, you know what I mean? If it's integers, there's a really good chance that it will, you'll be able to guess it and get it in. I was never good at, even with integers, guessing tests. I would, couldn't factor until Cheryl taught me to factor by three when I got here. Okay. Um, <laughs> I guess it's a, it's a, a good, you know, you, it's, it's, it's a good, good opportunity to kind of give you, just give yourself a chance of, of doing and see what happens. Um, that's something you, uh, but, but I mean, also, even if it were integers like this, you can do the same procedure to help you if you're not sure with guessing and checking. I mean, it's a great thing. We have graphing calculators. So what you can do then is just graph this again, right? So this is my function. And wherever you see a lambda, you replace it by x. So this would be x cubed minus 2x plus 3. So you graph that on your calculator, and you find out for what x values does it equal 0. So, you know, if you're graphing something and it looks like this, all right. <laughs> okay, hold on a sec. My pen ran out. Um, all right. Close. Uh, all right. Okay. I seem to be running out of lots of pens these days. So, um, so if you have something that looks like this, for example, if this is your f of x, then wherever it's cutting, those are going to be your roots. Okay. And so, therefore, like let's say x is equal to three. What that means is when you put 3 in there, it makes it 0. So what that means is you can factorize it as x minus 3. Does, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So what I would suggest is, personally, I would suggest probably that. Um, let me just see. Rick, do you, do you have a graphing calculator? Rick? Hello, Rick. Did I lose you? Um, just a second. I just got an important phone call real quick. It'll take me like 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Sorry. Alright, sorry. What okay. The question again? Uh, so, the deal is then... To solve this, what you really want to then do is just is graph this function. So wh what we would do, and then find the roots of this function to help you figure out these eigenvalues. So you had f of x is equal to minus x cubed minus 1.12x plus 0 0.384. So what I would do is come along and you know, go to a graphing device and plot this guy. And let me just see if I can pull this up on the computer here. Um, Google, Google, Google. Um, graphing applet. D. 
just try to pull something up here. try to find a graphing oh all right this computer here doesn't support Java all right well that's that's not going to help very much now is it um Uh, hold on, let me see if let me just see if I can get something so I can plot this for you guys here. So, um, it just works easier if I can actually show you what's happening. Actually, do you guys have a graph of that already? Okay, maybe I can just put that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, that actually, I can see that pretty well. I don't know if others can see that pretty well. Uh, ooh. Rick, can you see that? Yeah, I can, I can see it. Okay. So basically what this graph is, is this function. And so what you look for is then um, the roots, right? So it goes here, here, and here. And then what that will be is, so uh, when you plot this, so it's going to be like that. Then you use your graphing calculator. It'll have a um, probably some root finding tool on here. I guess second calc. Okay, find a zero. Calculate the zeros. Okay, and then you come to the left bound. And all right, so I can come to the what this does. I don't know if you can see this on the calculator. It's flashing here on the left-hand side of the root. I say there's the left right root. And I come over here to the right bound of the root. And then it should come back and tell me the right answer. And I think it comes back at the root here. It comes back and tells me is it x equal to minus 0 0.24. Was that one of the eigenvalues? That's weird. Oh, oh, Kim, you entered in, um, you put in minus x cubed plus 1.12x. Okay. <laughs> right. I think it was minus, wasn't it? Is that, I, I don't know. I mean, I didn't work out the characteristic equation. Okay. So tr try that again. I had minus. You had minus, right? Yeah. Okay, so let me, yeah, let's try it again. Okay, thank you. Oh, then it looks like that. Oh, then we need to zoom out probably. Why is it not? You had plus? Okay, so I guess there's some discussion about whether it should be a plus or a minus here. What did the back of the book say for eigenvalues? 1.2, negative 0.8, negative 0.4. Okay. So, um, okay, hold on. This is outgoing. Okay, so we're recording this. Um, let's just see if this is what the back of the book says is the answer. We can actually check to see if one of these actually works in here. So in other words, what I'm going to do now is go minus 0 0.4 cubed minus minus 1.12 minus 0 0.4 plus 0 0.384. And if you can put that on your calculator, see if that actually does equal zero. If it doesn't, that means we've got the wrong characteristic equation. You know, in other words, what I'm doing is I'm taking the answer and checking to see the equation we have is actually correct. Just I mean, just quickly looking at that. So, just wait. So, Michelle and Kim here, you guys got minus x cubed plus 1.12x? Yeah, I got plus. I got minus, but. Okay. Yeah, I got 
Okay, so we have, okay, good. So let's. I'm going to try to. I'm going to try to. So what happens when you do this one? You get a plus. One point two. No, no, no. I huh? get a, when I do that one, I get like. Okay, so I can't get any graphing on here, so that's my problem. Well, maybe I can. I'm waiting for it to work on here. Can you hit the thing there, Michelle? So it can. Can you hit that just so Rick knows what we're doing? For when I put in negative point four in the equation, I get a positive point eight nine six. So it doesn't look like the minus is right. So I put it in when it was a plus one point one two, and it worked. And it worked, and it gives you zero. So I think. Then the correct graph, the correct thing is m the correct, correct characteristic equation is minus lambda cubed plus 1.12 lambda plus 0 0.038. So, hold on a sec. Uh, people get it, like no, Michelle here, you didn't get the plus, right? Okay, so let, uh, Rick, you didn't get the plus either, did you? No, and I didn't have point oh three eight at the end either. Oh, all right, okay. okay. So it looks like we might just, let's just step back and I'll try to go through it. Okay, what number again was it? Okay, oh, I got gotcha. you. All right, let's, okay, let's go through zero, one point four. If you see me making a mistake, yell out. Let me know, okay? Because to find it, it's um, a minus lambda i3, right? So therefore, it is minus lambda, minus lambda, minus lambda, 1.4, 1.2, 0 0.8, 0, 0, 0.4. And now I've got to work out the determinant of this puppy, right? Okay. This is where, if you notice, with this eigenvalue stuff and eigenvector stuff, it's kind of taken everything that you've done before and putting it together. Okay, that's always really nice to put it all together. Because once you get this part, then you know that you'll have everything else under control. So that's good. All right, the determinant of this puppy. All right, so then this is plus, minus, plus, minus lambda. I'm taking this guy, getting rid of those. And therefore, I want the determinant of minus lambda, 0, 0 0.4 minus lambda. And then it's minus 1.4, the determinant. That goes away, and I have 0 0.8 minus, right? Because this goes away, and this goes away, and that's what I'm left with. And then the last one is plus 1.2 times the determinant of, and I get rid of that and that, and I'm left with this. 0 0.8 minus lambda, 0, 0 0.4. Uh, Rick, do you get something like this? Ah, do you find a mistake there? Well, actually, when I did it, I went down. This one? Uh, this one, so I could do one last step. Does that make a difference? Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's a smart move, okay? So let's, okay, you, you went this way? Yep, I, I guess I wasn't thinking that smart, right? Let me go down here. Okay, so it should give you the same answer. So it's plus here and minus. And so you did minus lambda times the determinant. So you did that times the determinant of that. Minus lambda 0, 0 0.4 minus lambda. And then you had minus 0 0.8 because it's plus. And times the determinant of, and then you get rid of that and that like that. So you get, now my fingers are too thick. Here we go, like that. The determinant of that guy, which is 1.4, 1.2, 0.4 minus lambda. 
Okay. Now, Michelle, did you, you said you found your, okay, so Michelle found, found the problem that she was having, so it's minus lambda. The determinant of that is lambda squared, okay, minus 0 0.8 times the determinant of this puppy, which is minus 1.4 lambda, minus, or well, 0.4 times that is what? Uh, 0 0.48, okay, and then this is minus lambda cubed, minus and minus gives you plus 1.12, I'm guessing, was it? Mm -hmm. Because that's a plus, and then this gives you plus 0.8 times 0.48, I don't know, what's that, 0 0.384? 384? How did that go for you, Rick? Yep, I forgot to cancel my negatives. It should be plus. Ah, okay. All right. Okay. All right, good. So I think we're all on the same page with, um, hopefully we're all on the same page now with our characteristic equation, f of lambda. And what we're going to do now is set lambda equal to x so we can graph this puppy. 1, 2, x. 0 0.384, okay? And then I think if we graph it, Kim, you had the graph of that there, did you? Okay, thank you. Yep, my computer thing is still installing Java. Apparently taking a very long time. Ah, excellent, okay? And so this is what the graph looks like. And so now we want to go zooming in, I guess. Zoom in. Do I hit just enter? Oh. oh, you have to do it twice? Oh, okay. Is that you, Trish? Okay. Oh, all right, all right. That's no, that's okay. I just didn't. Whoopsie daisy. I just wondered if something in. in it sounds like it's coming up from here, and I was like, wow, there's something going on down here. Okay, whoa. Okay, so there you have it, right? So now we've just got to find our zeros. So, okay, now let me see if I can get this right. Um, the, on your calculator, there'll be a zero function, so you hit the zero. And then what it's going to ask you is the left bound. And let's go for this root over here. Okay, let's go here. So you move that, there's that, I don't know if you can see that splosh thing there. Let me zoom in a bit more. I move that thing over, and we'll go for that root over there. Whoa, where's it going? Okay, let me zoom in a little bit more. There it is, right there. Okay, that can be my left bound. Okay, I'm good with that. And then you've got it, because you've got to kind of envelope your zero. And there's my right bound right down there. And the root is somehow in between. And I say enter. And then it should come back with the answer. And it says minus, here it says x is equal to minus 0 0.64. But that's not equal to one of the answers, is it? But I don't know. You put in your answer and you got the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's have a look at this. Minus x cubed plus 1.12x. Hmm. Okay. So, okay, let me just see if I can... No, something is wrong with the zero function here. Because it actually is at minus 0.8. The, the zero, I, okay, I don't know what's wrong, but either I'm, it's either an operator error or somehow the calculator is not finding your zeros correctly because this is when it's on the zero and then the number here is minus 0.8 basically. So uh, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, I guess can, if you can have a play with that to see what's going on, but yeah, the, the zero is clearly at minus 0.8, and then you move it along to the other place. 
and you get a zero here of about minus 0.4 again. So what's happening is it, this is actually working, but your zero calculator is not working somehow. Which I'm feeling really odd. So hopefully everybody else's calculator is is actually finding its zeros when it says it's finding its zeros. So then you get minus 0 0.8, x is minus 0 0.4, and then I'm guessing at the other end it's going to be plus 1.2, right? Over over here it's going to be plus 1.2, and so when you get the zeros. What that means is your original function, minus x cubed, is it plus 1.12x plus 0 0.384? It means these are the roots. So you can always write down your equation as x minus each root. So it's minus 0 0.08, x minus minus 0 0.4, x minus 1.2 equals 0. Whoopsie daisy, I've got to zoom out some more. Sorry about that. And then, so, but um, you know, I mean, of course, basically they give you the, the eigenvalues. I mean, those are the eigenvalues that you have. So, uh, Kim and Michelle here, does that answer your question of how to kind of go with that? For when the, and Trish, I think you had the same kind of question too. For the factoring one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I would do if you're getting into a real pickle with these, is use your graphing calculator, find the roots. And uh, Rick, what about yourself? How are you doing over there? Oh, well, that helped a lot. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it's... It's one of those weird things. Um, I guess I hadn't appreciated that we had a nasty matrix like that. I m would have mentioned something about that. Okay, but yeah, n yeah. Never, never worry about trying to use your calculator. Try to kind of figure out something like that. Should be good. Good question. Okay, thanks, Kim. Okay, uh, now I'm just trying to remember everybody's questions that we had. Um, let me just go back. Um, I'm just going to check with Michelle. Uh, Michelle, how you doing? You you doing all right there now? Yes, I'm fine. Okay, good. Um, all right. Now, Rick, did that mainly answer the question that you had there? Yep, that was the question I had. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, Trish, everybody here, I think we now have applications, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's 41 I discussed. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, why don't we have a look, and I'll just I'll write it down so that everyone can see. Um, this is going to be page 329, number 41. It, it goes, okay, it's a long question, all right. Yeah, those are my favorite kind of questions, <laughs> as you could have guessed by this stage. Okay. Um, Zoom in. Oh, this is the same problem we were talking yeah. about. Yep. Okay, gotcha. Uh, yep, okay. Oh, and this is about mountain goats? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Which was fun, but, <laughs> but I lost the fun on page four. Oh, it was... <laughs> <laughs> Everything was going good until it hit page four, huh? Well, I don't know. I just thought... Yep, okay, let's have a look. I don't know. Well, I... I found my vectors, and I guess I don't know if they're right or not. And then I kept going, and I set up my S. Okay. And found the inverse. Okay. And then I started doing my A of T. Okay. And I ended up with this. Okay. And I just don't know what to do, because you can't combine oh. these, can you? Okay. So hold on, let me zoom out here. So, um, oh, okay, can you, here, let me just, uh, do you have a pencil there? I just want to point out one thing about this. Okay, so what we're looking at here, folks, is, um, is, is Michelle has gone through and in essence solved this big problem of finding the, of basically diagonalizing the matrix. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just kind of get everybody up to speed with this problem number 41. So. In essence, you, you had the matrix that we were just talking about. We found the eigenvalues that we've just spoken about. Now, did you have the right eigenvalues? You just used the yes. ones? Okay. Yeah, I just used the back of the that book. Used the back of the book and then would ask about I that. Cheated. No, and that, that's a smart move <laughs> because this is a long problem, mm -hmm. and so it's a really good idea. Uh, that's actually why I tried to choose the application problems, at least one of them.
that has the answer so you know to look at it to help. Okay, good, good. So that's just my... So using... Here's your eigenvectors. Okay. And so you find that for the, the negative... Uh, for the 1.2, here's your eigenvector. Mm -hmm. For the minus 0.8, here's the other eigenvector. And for the minus 0.4, right down here at the end, here's the other eigenvector. Then you go through and you get your S matrix. You find your S inverse down here. And then you can go through and work out your AT, which is S diagonal to the T, S inverse. You put it all together and you get that down here. Well, I think that was my... That was the first. That was those two. Oh, that was the first two. Oh, and then you've got your other. Okay, gotcha. And then, mm -hmm. oh yeah, the next page. <coughs> okay, so here's a point that I just want to point out to everybody as well. See, this is minus 0.8 to the t. You need to put your parentheses around it because what it is is negative 0.8 right. t, not just point. It's not negative. Right. Yeah. It's, so yeah. you don't know if it's positive or negative. See, when you write that, that means that. Okay, so, yeah, yeah, so just be careful about that. I, I know you know right. what it is, but just be real careful about that. And, and it's just a general note to be careful, okay. So over here, it's, it's always going to be... Mm -hmm. The T is the outside. Ah, and then you see here, this is where it's a problem, because you see you took that minus and that minus and cancelled them here, probably. Yeah, that's what you did. Mm -hmm. See here, you got minus 0.8 yep. and the minus... And so... Yep. Go like that, and then you can't cancel it because right. it depends on what t is as right. to whether it's plus or minus. So, okay. That's so, I, I, well, but it's easy to that. Right. You'll you'll be fine with that. So, okay. So, the vision is you are now down here, and what the heck do and I then do? And I have to multiply that by my initial values, right? Because that's what those are my yes, initial values. So I that's right. A of t times initial yes. by the R. Yep. Yep. That's right. I don't know how to do that. I guess. Oh, okay. All right, gotcha. Four. And then, what, so what is the question? Yeah. Find the closed formulas. Well, you found the closed formulas. Oh, oh and then the, oh, okay, mm -hmm. this is an interesting problem. Okay, yeah, wh what you're finding out is that real life is difficult. <laughs> right? It's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life, life, real, and, and actually this is a very good discussion to have when when you talk about when you're talking with your students mm -hmm. what happens is in math classes you typically do problems that are really pretty easy N now it's hard to say that to somebody because th th what happens is they're not easy as you're learning that material mm -hmm. right but you can see that a lot of the very you know the non-applied problems where I give you you know where they give you a matrix that's nice and you have nice eigenvalues and all the rest everything works fine mm -hmm. Then the moment you actually come to a problem that, you know, this goat problem is not crazy ridiculous mm -hmm. to think about, right? The, the different ages of goats and stuff, mm -hmm. right? And young. And how many would live. And how, yeah. And, and actually, this is a really simple problem. This is a simple applied problem, right? Because you say goats only live three years. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know about you, but I think goats live a lot longer than three years. <laughs> I mean, the goats I've known live through much longer than that. And so you can see already it's kind of a simplification to help make mm -hmm. the math at least tractable. So what this shows you is that in math problems, you've actually, w the stuff you're learning is actually already a very simplified version of it, that when you really apply it, it gets much more messy. And, you know, often people ask, you know, students will ask, you know, why do I care about math, you know, da, da, da. And, and the thing is, it's very hard to say why you care, because if you show them a real, real problem, the math is horrendous, right? I mean, you straight away look at this and you're like, I mean, that would that would turn anybody off within yep. a second. You know, oh, yeah, just go through and solve that. <laughs> a and so, you know, one of the things to get across is actually some of the math that you're doing, believe it or not, when you're doing it in general life, is actually really the simple version of it. When you actually go out to real life and use it, which is why you care about the math, it's much harder. But let me put it the other way around, which is, Math is generally derived from a problem that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. So for example, this goat farmer had this problem, right? And he wanted to find out the answer. Well, what happens is this goat farmer has this problem, and then over here, there's people who are spilling stuff into a lake. They have this problem, blah, 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 blah. Everybody has this problem. What math does 
is now, could you imagine trying to figure out this in this particular case by itself, this in this particular case? You know, imagine all these different cases. Mm -hmm. The thing that math does is it takes all these different problems and looks for commonalities such that, oh, here is the general approach to this thing and, uh, and can simplify it so that you, I mean, because I think everybody has understood what's kind of gone on. Mm -hmm. y you understand how to do what, what's necessary here. So it's taken real problems and simplified it to the point where it's, um, let's come back. It, it's simplified it to the point where you can understand what's going on in general. And then you have to back out of that to actually go back to a real problem where you've got the simple ideas in your mind, mm -hmm. but the actual implementation is often just messy and tricky. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you're talking to your students about math and how you use it, and I mean, because you know, when you're in a class and you're doing you know, 5x plus 3x equals 2, you're like, well, who cares about that? Well, you say to them, well, what you're doing is learning how to do the very general simple problem so that when you get a real life problem and you put in real numbers, you have a really good conceptual understanding of what's going on so you're not so scared by it. Mm -hmm. I think if you had this rabbit problem, if I had just given you this problem without talking about all of the stuff we've spoken about, there's no way you could have solved it. No. Now you understand conceptually what's going on. The only thing is, it's horribly messy. <laughs> but, but that's really your only issue right, right now, right? Well, I just didn't know. I got to this point and I thought, am I even right here? That's and right. I don't know really. Right. You, you I don't really know what to do. Right. So I'm just going to stop. Right. Do they have the answers in the back so we can check? Uh, that yeah, was what I was hoping. They are. Okay. But so, I don't know how to get to them. Okay. So let, let's go through this. But I, I just wanted to share that for a few minutes. And that, that, it's funny because that's what I was thinking when I was going through this. I was thinking, gosh, you know, you start in algebra and you're doing these problems that really aren't even realistic, and then you start going the more realistic you get the. The more pieces of paper it takes. <laughs> That's right. And, 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 what it, but, and, and so what you see is, and this is often a thing that I, I really try to express to people, and it's really good to install in your students, is all of the stuff that you think is really complex and messy and hard is actually the really easy part <laughs> of it. That what we're doing is I simplifying. Like you, so it's good. <laughs> so actually what happens is mathematics is the simplest way to look at problems, the easiest way to do it. All of this notation, all of this stuff was developed over hundreds of years when they had real problems and they had to figure out simple ways to solve them. They didn't have a computer. Just they, they didn't have a computer and, but even having the computer doesn't conceptually, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I guess, you know, I mean, right at this stage, we can't go up to a computer and say, look, I've got this how many, many how many goats will I have you left? Can't Google that. You can't Google that, right, exactly. And so, uh, and so, what I'm trying to say is that actually the math that we use is really a highly simplified, easy form of solving very complicated problems. And that's one way you can answer a student's question of why do I care about mm -hmm. this, whatever this happens to it's be. It's just too bad you can't get students to appreciate story problems. Because I know even now when you say application problems, you go, oh, geez, I don't want to do them. People but it seems like... Right. I don't know. That's what's important. This is what is important. And, and you know, what I would say about that, one of the, the, the approaches that I would take is, I think uh, with computers, you can actually solve this problem. As long as you understand it conceptually, I could go online to the algebra toolkit, and I, in essence, I could just do one step after another after another, mm -hmm. and come up with this answer without having to do all the sweat. And that's really what calculators are doing for you at high mm -hmm. school so that you can actually solve much more complicated problems and then they can see how it's actually useful. Mm -hmm. But the problem is you don't understand the generalized way of doing it if you're looking at a detailed problem. And, and that's when, when we talk about doing applications and you know everybody wants to see applications in the classroom. Well, the problem that I have with it is, yeah, if you start off with applications, it's already so much harder mm -hmm. than if you've simplified it to a more abstract level you're already going to lose a lot of people. So I think as teachers, you really need to think about that compromise there mm -hmm. and how you do that. But I agree with you. It's, it's very because challenging. every level, I think you hate story problems. You hate every grade, every level. I think mm -hmm. you ask kids. And they hate, that's right. They really hate story mm -hmm. problems. But at the end of the day, story problems are actually what math is about. Right. Right. I mean, you know, the great mathematicians didn't sit down there and think, oh, let me create these matrices so I can really make students in linear algebra just hate me or something, you know. They were really just like, well, how the heck do we solve this problem? And, uh, and then it became more abstract and went from there. But yeah, story problems, 
I missed him. I'm very interested, and in, in maybe you know anybody else out there can share with us is, are there really good ways to help people think about story problems? Mm -hmm. And I think as math teachers, I think that's going to be one of the things you're going to have to really, th mm -hmm. I think it's going to be the, I think it's one of the most difficult things you have to really think about is how do you get students to appreciate it, at uh, least. Yes, to understand the value of a story problem. Mm -hmm. um, and because my attitude is about this is that this is why you ask people to study math, so that they can take their real life problem that they have translate it into math, which is really the easy language, mm -hmm. and solve it and then bring it back out. And I would say probably, and I include myself in this, I don't do a very good job of doing that, right? I mean, I think everybody in this class probably is finding the story problems the hardest, right? Mm -hmm. On the terms tests, you look at that and you're like, I don't know. right? <laughs> and, and, you know, it's a real challenge for me. I don't know how to to do it other than to just try to give you lots of exposure to it mm -hmm. and let you develop your own pathways. But, you know, if, if you do run across like a, you know, a class on problem solving or something like that, that would probably be a good class to do yeah. for, you know, because you need your uh, continuing ed credits and stuff. Um, something to really think about. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but at the end of the day, what it comes down to is one of the things with story problems that's really important is you've got to know what tools you have available to you You've got to know what tools you have available to you so that when you take your story, you can translate it into that language mm -hmm. and then use that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things you have to really work on, mm -hmm. is, is knowing what tools you have. Okay, sorry, it was kind of an abstract discussion, but kind of important. Um, so, yeah, so Michelle, you've kind of got down to here. After all of that, we've kind of got down to here. Uh, what I would do now is you really do need to take this matrix and multiply it by this matrix, so uh, by this vector. Mm -hmm. I, and, and so if I can actually kind of try to do some magic with this, which is... So I, I know I have some errors already, though. You may do. Um, what I can do... Yes. Let's look at the... Because we can compare it with the answers. That's yeah. what I was hoping with this one. That one, I think. Yeah. No, I decided I, to cancel the negative on some. Yeah, I think so. So basically, your answer to this problem of x at any time t is equal to a to the t times your x0 initial, right? And mm -hmm. this is your x0 initial, yep. and here's your a to the t. And so what you now have to do is simply this take this matrix and multiply it by this. And so this is going to equal, and I'm only going to start just to give you the mm -hmm. idea. So it's going to be 600 times 0 0.45, 1.2 to the t plus 0 0.8 minus 0 0.8 to the t minus 0 0.25. What's the, uh, the, the first element of this is going to be nasty. <laughs> I mean, it, it is going to be nasty, but, but, but don't despair, <laughs> is, is I guess what I'm trying to say. So I took the 600, I multiplied it by that. Then I take the 100 and I multiply it by that. And you go and go on. So mm -hmm. how do you eventually... Yep, that's a good question. I mean, you can't combine terms or anything. I can, so though. Hold on. Okay. okay. So that's my... I, mean, I guess that's what I got to hear and said was... <coughs> you will be able to. Because what's going to happen is... I'll have a few 1.2 to the t. That's right. What you then do is if you look at this, you've got 600 times 0.45, mm -hmm. which I don't know, is like 275. So 275, 1.2 to the t, and then there's a, the, then There'll there's be a, another one. a zero, yeah. So what you right do there. is, yeah, sorry, oh, yep. Right there. There's one there, and there's one there. So you take all these coefficients, and you add and them up. put them together. So what you're ultimately going to end up with when you do this, is you're going to end up with some number, 1.2 t, t, plus some other number, negative 0.8, plus some other number, what is it? Uh, maybe minus zero point or uh, minus some other number zero point four to the t. Okay. And th that's what it's going to look like. Now, what becomes nice about this is underneath you'll have the same. Right. Okay. Now, what you can notice about this. Okay is that you're going to have number, 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 okay. 
common factor, separate it out into a vector. 1.2 to the t times that vector, which is these numbers, plus minus 0 0.8 to the t times that vector, plus 0 0.4 to the t times this vector here. Okay. That's when it looks nice mm -hmm. at the end. Okay, so now that you've got it down to something like this, here's the trick. What's going to happen as you go, it doesn't ask the question what's going to happen to our goats and cows as they go off to infinity given these initial yep. conditions. Well, have a look. 0 0.4 to the t. By the way, what I want to kind of point out here is that what you've done is you've translated a matrix to the power of t, ultimately, to just numbers to the power of t, which oh. is really pretty neat, <coughs> mm -hmm. okay? Because matrices to the power of t are really quite complicated. So okay? the only one that matters is the 1.2 to the The only one that matters as time goes off to infinity because 0.8 to the t, or minus zero. that will go to zero, and 0.4 to the, to the t, multiply zero. goes to zero. So actually this is the only thing that really matters. Hmm. So what happens is, and, and let me just go through what might happen here. Okay, I, yet again, I don't know the answer, but let's imagine these, all right, let's imagine that these question marks here were, let's say this was 100, this was 200, and say this was 100. Mm -hmm. No idea what they are, okay? So you end up that your x at any t is equal 1.2 t times 100, 200, as t goes off to infinity, right? So it becomes really large. What you see then is, what is this going to be? Well, this is just a big number. So for any given t, if I choose t equal to say 100, so after 100 years, I think that was it, t is in years, right? Mm -hmm. So after 100 years, this poor goat farmer is still there, okay? What's happened to his goats and, and all the rest? How are they, what are they, what's happened to their population? Well, 1.2 to the 100 is just a big number. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, let's say it's 30, right? 30 times 100, 200, 100. What that means is, at long times, he gets more goats, but the ratio of young to middle age to old doesn't change. doesn't change. He just gets more of them. And what's happening is, by the way, if you look at this, every year it's going up by 1.2. Mm -hmm. That's basically 20% growth. In other words, what right. it means is in the long run, what happens with this goat problem is that he's going to end up with a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 in terms of old to young, and every year he's going to get 20% more goats. That's actually the simple answer to that problem, if, if th this is what it was. Complicated problem, you can actually now figure out in the long run what's going to happen to his goat population if he carries on doing this and all these equations, you know, and, and nothing changes in terms of the death rates and birth rates of, mm -hmm. his, of his goats. I'm just wondering, like, if you just, mm -hmm. I don't even know how to say that, if you just skipped all that and said, whoops, looked at your ratios and then your percentages, how close you would be without, oh, you good know what I mean? Yeah, how good, do matrix, yeah right? good question, right? So uh, Michelle's question is, can I just look at this? Lazy math. Right, no, I d <laughs> well, no, it, and that's really good. Are you, it's heuristic math, I would call <laughs> it. I'd be more, more optimistic about it. Um, right, you can look at this, and, and I, I guess my question is... I don't know how you I, set it up exactly, but... Off the top of my head, I, I'm going to... There's got to be a way to just say, take these three numbers and say, well, 30% of these survive, you know, so in 20 years, how many would I have? Because a goat par farmer, I assume, wouldn't care about 100 years. Right, right. Maybe he only says, well, I'm only going to have goats for another... 15 years. Okay. So. Well, then you've got to just figure out how significant is 0.4 to the 15 or 30. Mm -hmm. So what is 0.4 to the 30? Let's imagine he's got a 30-year life cycle. So, uh, Kim, could you figure out what's 0.4? In other words, how important are these other parts that mm -hmm. we ignored? So 0.4 to the 30 is 1.15 times 10 to the minus 12. So in other words, after 30 years, he could care less about the other mm -hmm. part, he could care less. And what you're saying is, how would we figure out this 1.2? Right, you said, because there's three parts to this. The answer has, well, I is there some way you could look at this and kind of I'm figure it out? I'm just is there some way you can just look at these three numbers and say, well, I know that every year 
30% survive. I don't know. I was just thinking, is there any way you could even just, like you said, heuristically think about it without, because I'm assuming most farmers don't know how to set up matrixes, so what would they actually, what do they actually do? <laughs> well, well, actually, that is an excellent question. What, what do they actually do? Because they would have to know how big to make their buildings and how do they control their herds. What I would say is, this is typically the way it would. This is typically the way this is done. Um, is that most problems become problems of what has somebody else done and what's their experience. Probably. In other words, if you go to a farmer who's been doing this for 15 years, then th you'd go and look at well, what's your ratio of old, young, and medium-aged goats, and 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 does that stay relatively constant over time? So you just go back and look at the data. Mm -hmm. And so it's very empirical as opposed to actually trying to figure this out. Here's the problem with this. And what happens now if a new medicine comes along mm -hmm. and changes the mortality rates mm -hmm. of your goats? Or just makes more juniors stay alive. Mm -hmm. then, or exactly. It just it changes one of the mortality ratios. What happens then is what are the so, – so here's the drug company. So this is what happens, right? The drug company comes to you and says, well, it's going to increase your mortality or it, it decrease your mortality or something of juniors, right? And then the farmer goes, oh, well, that's great, but then what am I going to do about that? Because mm -hmm. I've, got, I've got certain, you know, mm -hmm. let's imagine for some reason you want to separate the different right. age groups. Um, You've only got so much room for them. Uh, that's right. W what am I going to do? How am I going to do that? Well, one thing the farmer can do is just carry on with what they've got and then figure out as you go. <laughs> they will basically live every one of these years. And then at some point, they won't, be able, they won't have enough room in, in storage. They'll have to just add according to what the data they have. You know, in mm -hmm. other words, you just do what you ever have to do. Mm. Oh, yeah. That's right. Sell them, yeah. eat them, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the other part is then what the drug company would come back to you is they will have done this calculation. Mm. And because the drug company will employ mathematicians. Mm -hmm. And these mathematicians will answer these questions. Because they need to know. Because they need to know. Because now they can go to the farmer and say to the farmer, Okay, you now we're going to have, after 20 years, you're going to have to know, you're going to have these ratios of young to old to medium. I suppose maybe they can even say in five years you're going to have 30 more goats. That's right. Or That's right. Whatever. That's right, exactly. So this is, in essence, exactly how mathematicians earn their living. They yeah, answer these. companies come up with those numbers when they say stuff. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, yeah, there, there it's more statistics right. um, and hype. Um, so there's kind of a combination of the two there. But statistics and, and, and obviously advantage to the company. But that's yeah, this is what this is what mathematicians would do basically hmm. is is they take problems that most people would look at and say, look, I don't know the answer, so I'm just going to sit there and let it come to me. <laughs> but the problem with that is it's not very efficient for solving the problem. Right. And math is all about being predictive and mm -hmm. solving problems before they become problems. Mm -hmm. um, so e excellent question. Okay. Very interesting. There you go. Good. <laughs> What's nice about linear algebra is actually the problems that you have are actually, you could envision having that problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sometimes in math you have problems where you're like, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Like build a dam. Yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good question. Now, are there any more questions, do you guys? Do you want to just kind of work your way through that? Oh, I had a quick one. Yeah. Um, okay. But yeah, one of the messages I'd really, you know, as, as teachers, math is the easy way to solve problems. I mean, I, I, I cannot stress that enough. It, it, and it's very hard to get that across to individuals, that it's actually the easy way to do it, because it certainly doesn't look easy. No. Right? It doesn't feel easy. Number 12. This okay. is part three. This right there, page 317. I just wasn't sure. Okay. Finding the eigenvalue. I don't even know if I did that right. And that algebra is the most explicit. So I went through and found my... Eigenvalues. I just didn't mm -hmm. know if I wrote them all out 
like that. That's fine. That's fine. So I have one twice. You have, yeah. Rated. Yeah, so probably, yeah. So, so this is problem number 12 on page, uh, if I can just write up here, mm -hmm. page 317, okay? And what Michelle has done here is come out with the fact that there is lambda 1. What you can do is give yourself a table, say eigenvalue, okay. and it's 1 minus 1 and 0. Mm -hmm. You have three distinct eigenvalues, and they're algebraic multiplicity. So 1 is 2. Is 2, 1, and 1. Okay. And that's... That's how you answer yeah. the question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you did it like this too, I'm fine with that. Algebraic multiplicity is one of those things where if you're talking to another mathematician, you'd like to know what they say. Mm -hmm. But if you just tell me I've got it one, repeats. it repeats like that, I'm not going to argue with that at all. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. But I guess if you ask algebraic multiplicity, I better know. If I ask that question, that's <laughs> right. I'm not sure I will, but I could imagine I could. Okay, good question. Um, Rick, how are you doing? You all right there? Yep, just trying to work through number 41. So did that, that discussion make a bit, a bit of sense to you there of how to do that problem? Yep. Okay, yeah, it's a long one, so good luck with that. Um, my suggestion would be maybe to, to, as you're going through, just make sure you, if you can go to the algebra toolkit, I think you might be able to check uh, at least getting your eigenvalues and eigenvectors right. Just make sure you get that right right at the beginning, otherwise it's going to be just a mess carrying through. Yep. Okay. And Michelle, how are you doing there? I'm fine. Okay, good. And Dawn, how are you doing here? Good. Okay. Any questions at all? No. Nope. Okay, good.
problem 44 um, with this lake. Uh, the question is, is the initial condition 100 kilograms? And yeah, so I think that's right. So what happened is 100 kilograms went into Lake Sills. So it would be the, the X0 would be, yeah, let me, yeah, let me write that down. Yeah, your X0 is going to be 100, 0, 0, something like that. Yep, that's good. Okay, there we go. So, um, we'll see Daisy. So this is page, I need to zoom out a bit here. Page 6 of the book, number, was it 24, Michelle? Yes. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. Okay, that's kind of down here. On your next trip to Switzerland, you should take the scenic boat ride from Rheinfall to Rhino and back. The trip downstream from Rheinfall to Rhino takes 20 minutes and the return trip takes 40 minutes. Okay. The distance between them is 8 kilometers. How fast does the boat travel relative to the water and how fast does the river Rhine flow in this area. You may assume both speeds to be constant throughout the journey. Okay, so I guess the, the way to think about this then is, um, let's think how you want to do this. So from Rhine Fall to Rhine O. Notice how the words always start with the Rhine, because in Germany apparently the way they name their cities is based on the river, which actually doesn't make such a, it's probably, you know, O, o may mean up and fall may mean down, so up Rhine, down Rhine type of thing, kind of makes sense. Um, so the trip downstream, well, I guess it's the opposite, right? I guess, so I've actually got these the opposite way round. Let's draw a Rhine, Rhine fall. Rhine O, okay? Yeah. And so the trip downstream takes 20 minutes. So the, s the stream is flowing this way at some speed V, right? And that's the water speed, okay? V of the water. I don't know if people can see that. Let me just zoom in it. Maybe just focus a bit. Nope. I don't think that's right. Okay, I'll try to draw it bigger here. So this is V water. So maybe I'll call it W. W is the speed of the water. Okay. And then relative to the water, there's the boat speed, which I'm going to call B. B is the speed of the boat. Okay. So when you're going downstream, the total speed of the boat when you're going downstream is what? Relative to the, to the ground. The boat is traveling at speed, let's say the boat is traveling at 10 meters a second relative to the water, and the water is traveling at 20 meters a second relative to the bank. So relative to the bank, how fast are you moving? Yeah, we'll go through an example of this. The boat speed, let's say, is 10 meters a second, and the water is going at 20 meters a second. So this is the water, the speed of the water relative to the bank, and this is the speed of the boat relative to the water. So my question is, what's the speed of the boat relative to the bank? Put it in a different way. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's a different question. Um, Okay, if the boat was not moving relative to the water, so its speed is zero. So let's imagine the boat's speed is zero, and you put a boat into the river. How fast is the boat moving relative to the bank? 20, right? You just sit in there, you're going to go with the flow. Okay. If you are now moving faster than that in the direction of the stream, Okay, so if you're just sitting in the boat, not moving at all, okay, 
Let's come back here. So if you were just sitting in the boat, not moving at all, then you would be flowing at the same rate as the flow of the water. But now you're moving faster than just the water, right? You're moving relative to the water at 10 meters a second. So the water is flowing at 20 meters a second relative to the bank, and you are now flowing at 10 meters a second. So you add those, wouldn't you? Right? Okay. So therefore, how fast is the speed of the boat? 30 meters a second. You add them. Okay. So therefore, in terms of variables, because we don't know what either of them is, isn't it W plus B? There's a total speed of the boat when it's going downstream. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody have any questions about that? That you add up those two speeds. The water speed and the boat speed is how fast you're going. Now, if you'd ever wondered, if you've ever flown on... Well, if you've ever... What was that, Trish? If it drags on the bottom, then your speed will go down. Then, then, you'll, then you'll be in real trouble. Right? Yeah, th then you'll have sunk, and then you'll have a whole other worries about getting down to Rhino or whatever it is. You'll be worried about trying to get out of the Rhine. Okay? So, um, so, so, the, so this is the idea of the speed of the boat going downstream. Now, by the way, this idea of relative motions, have you ever traveled on a plane when you've gone to one city and then you've come back from the city and have you noticed how the times going one way are different from the times coming back? Okay. <laughs> no, the times are definitely different. When you go east versus west, okay, when you go uh, west, it's, yes, that's right. And when you go east, is that, it's because there's a prevailing wind. And it's not that the prevailing wind pushes you back, it does in some way, but that's not really the issue. It's like being in this, in this boat. If you go in the direction of the prevailing boat, in the direction of the prevailing wind in the airplane, then you add the speeds. So what do you think is going to happen when the boat comes back up and goes the other way? What is the total speed of the boat? Well, B minus W. It's going to be the boat minus the water speed. So now that you know what those are, do you think you can now go away and set up an equation for that? Because there's one more thing that you need to know, right? Which is they say how far it is away, right? They say the distance between here and here is eight kilometers. Right? So you've got expressions for the total speed going downstream or going upstream. And so you know, you know the speed and you know the distance. Okay. One thing they tell you is the time. How are speed, distance, and time related? Yeah, so distance equals rate times time. So okay, yep. Yeah. Distance equals rate times time. But rate, we don't usually talk about rate. When you're driving your car, you don't say, what's your rate? Right? What would be the other word we'd use for that? Speed. Yeah, hit the speed. Speed, right? What's your speed? Is what we're saying. Okay, very good. Okay. And and the reason I'm I'm saying rate versus speed is because rate is a generic word that can work for anything. In other words, rate is how quickly per second. So for example, I could be a rate could be gallons per second. That's a rate. And speed, kilometers per second, miles per hour, those are all rates. Rate is a generic term, but we're talking specifically with distance and time, so that's why we need to say it's word. Uh, it's speed, I should say. Okay? So good. Distance is speed times time. So what that means is uh, let's call distance D and speed V and time T. So I can rearrange this to say that time is distance over speed. Or actually, it doesn't really matter. I can leave it either which way. Okay. So what happens then, if you look at this problem, right, you know the total speed of the boat downstream. So you just look at this. Do I know, let's go to downstream. Whoopsie daisy, getting off the screen here. So now let's look at the downstream scenario. Okay, so in the downstream, what do you know? Do you know the distance? It's eight kilometers, right? 
You know the distance going downstream. What else do you know going downstream? You know the total boat speed going downstream is W plus B. What else do you know about going downstream from this problem? Well, that, that's, you don't actually know the river speed. How long it takes you, right? Okay. So the time is equal to, what is it, 20 minutes? Okay. So you know this, you know this, you know this. Can you now set up an equation that relates those? Well, there it is, right? Distance is speed times time. So distance is 8 equals the speed, W plus B, and the time is 20. That's one equation. Okay. Now I'll leave it up to you to go through, that was the downstream. You can set up the upstream equation. Then you'll have two equations, two unknowns, and now you can solve it. Okay? Does that answer? I, I, it was Kim, that was your question, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. All right. There you go. So now you can actually figure out how fast the Rhine flows downstream by simply knowing how far it is between the two towns and by knowing how long it takes to go one way versus another. So actually with aeroplanes, you could do exactly the same thing. If you go from here, let's say, to New York, and you find out going to New York one way takes two hours, coming back takes three hours, you can actually find out how fast the plane went and how fast the average wind is in between, you know, or how fast the, um, the air moves in that direction, okay, the average speed. Okay, so the question is, this was problem number four and problem set number two, is that yeah. correct? Yeah. And it was number one on page okay. 18. Number one on page 18. Okay, so let's just have a quick look. And so, okay, so here's my question for you, Trish. Mm -hmm. Is these are the same equations or different? Yeah, they're the same thing. Yeah. It's just when I did it last night, I went through and yep. I got the matrix, the um, reduced row echelon mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. And then I tried to figure out what the actual decimals were that would make that true. Okay. Um, here's, here's the issue for me. That that's I'm a having. lot of work. <laughs> well, that's, yeah, that's what I'm, because you see, I think you've got down here, and this is your sa same R ref, right? Right. And then you've got x1 minus 10x3 is that. You, you then make um, this the first, then this one yep. the second. Okay. Now, my suggestion would be to probably do these if you can underneath each other like I did this morning, you know what I mean? Okay. Like, yeah. have a pencil yeah. there? I oh, okay, you pen, okay. Yeah, try to do them underneath because when you, when you see them underneath each other, it's easier to go to here. However it works for you is fine. Okay. It just, because what happens is you get more variables, it sometimes gets even harder. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you put it down here and then this looks fine to me. This is exactly what you want to okay. do, okay? So you don't want the numbers. Well, <laughs> the, the question is for me <laughs> is th this I get, and I agree with this, mm -hmm. Where my question is, is because you did the same, you had the same equations to start off with. Uh -huh. How did you solve? I solved for x3. Yeah, and then substituted in for each other. <laughs> did a lot of stuff. I think what happened is you did you somehow you solve for x3 when uh -huh. x3 is not solvable because it's any real <laughs> number. Okay. Do you know what I mean? But these work. <laughs> No, they will work, okay. yeah. And I, what's happened is somewhere along the way, and, I, and this one I'm actually curious, I'm going to try to find. Somewhere along the way, okay, so I get that's what x3 is. Yep, I solved for x3 in all of them, and I figured if this equals x3 and that is x3, then those have to be equal to each other. Okay, and then you say, say how x1 is related to x2. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but then, oh, and then... And then I... I think I substituted in for x2. Yeah. Up here. Right, right. And then so you, then and then you give okay, so you put it back in there. 
Ah, okay. Yep. So you put x2 back in here, and then you have two equations and two unknowns. Yeah. Because you have an equation in x1 and x3, and x1 and x3 again, right? Yep. Okay. And, start over. <laughs> and then you start over again. What happens there is you can use one equation in another equation, mm -hmm. but you, you can't. How can I say it? You use both of them to get one equation, right. and then you put it back into both of them again. So you actually somehow gave yourselves three equations uh -huh. in that process of doing it. What's probably happened is somewhere along the way, and it's hard to tell where, that somehow you kind of, th there's an implicit assumption going to be there somewhere that a, that a zero has come in that maybe shouldn't have, or a one, a and then that's yeah. kind of led through the things. Um, did you ever have to divide? No, it doesn't look like you had to divide by x3 or anything. Mm -mm. Um, the, the problem is that what you've done is combine them. And what you can do is if you have two equations, what you can do is you can put one into the other or the other into that, but you can't combine both of them and then actually and end up with one, two, three, and then end up with three equations. Because then what that will happen is it will give you a definite answer because then you're going to have three equations and three unknowns. And that's the problem that you're having. So what I would suggest is, no, and, and also this was a lot of work and yeah. kind of confusing, <laughs> right? It's not that, it, it, sh it shouldn't be that hard in the sense that what you're looking for is, and I'm glad you raised this because you look for your pivots and all the rest of the free, Kay. and that's what will give you this. And then that will avoid that issue. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But that, that's a good question. I, I'm going to, um, it. It is a tricky thing because you do tend to want to, yeah, don't, I guess the thing is in the past you've done substitution and stuff, mm -hmm. but what you're doing with that, and, and actually this is exactly why we use the RF method, because you see it gets so confusing and so difficult, that's why we never use this anymore, we'll just do this and then you'd much prefer to do this, I guess, yeah. is, is the thing, right? No, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So from here on in, don't ever use substitution because it will right. only, it, it potentially, and this is one of the problems with, with substitution, even if you do the algebra right, you might actually double count an equation that you weren't meant to, mm -hmm. and then you're gonna lead up with an answer that's, this is correct, but the problem is it's only one of these ones. In other words, okay. we could actually work out, this is probably R equal to some particular thing. Right. What's happening is when you do this, you're actually over-constraining yourself and only ending up with one of the answers versus you actually have an infinite number. And, and, and there'll be some R value, and I don't know what it is, Maybe this is R equal to three halves or something like that that will give you your particular answer. Mm -hmm. But it's only one of them. And so that's why it worked, but you've, there's a whole bunch more out there. Okay. Okay? <laughs> so that's good. Good question. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Michelle, you doing all right out there? Yes, I'm doing fine. Okay, good. Rick, how you doing? Good, just going through some of the videos for six and seven here. Oh, okay. Um, Rick, do you have your, um, hold on a second here. Number seven on problem set two, where we had to do page 20, number 37. And it was one of those um, okay. factory ones with the, the three different systems of equations. Okay, and let me I get know what the solution's supposed to be, but I can't ever get that solution. Okay, let's have a look at that. Okay. Page 20. Oh, this is the one, um, this one here with the industries? Yep. Okay. All right. So I'm going to go through uh, this problem number seven on problem set two, page 20, number 37. It's the one dealing with the industries. Let me just check that other people are, how they're going. Oh, Dawn, that sounds better. You can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm good. Dawn, can I just ask you a quick question? Rick, I'll get back to you in a sec. Um, why sure. does it keep doing that? Do you know? Do you I don't know. I'm talking to the tech guy about it, and he thinks he has um, the answer, 
but um, I'll make sure that everything's good before I hang up. Okay, all right, thanks, Dawn, thank you. Okay, I'm just gonna go through a problem with Rick right now. Okay, and Michelle is, okay. All right, so let's go through this problem then, um, Rick, and we'll have a look and see what's, what's going on. I think the main issue here is setting it up. So what we wanna make sure is, do we have the equation set up right? Okay, so let's have a look here. Um, I'll have a look at my answers and see what we have. The six. And I, I kind of understand the setup. Like, I don't remember what question it was, but there was one with just two systems earlier, and I completely understood that one. I just, I cannot <laughs> figure out what I'm doing with this one with three. Okay, so let's have a look at your, um, let's have a look at your equation here. And I'll go, we'll get everybody to look at that. Okay, so let's have a look. X1 minus 0 0.2, 0 0.33. I agree with the first equation. 1 minus 0 0.4. I agree with the second equation. I agree with the third. Okay, so you've got your, um, you've got your uh, matrix set up okay. Uh, do you know what you want to do then? Okay, and you go through... And can you show me what you get at the end there? Oh, oh yes. Yeah, Basically, some when I went through and did all my steps to get the RF, yep. I just ended up with these big fractions, or these fractions at the end. Okay. And I got these approximate answers, which I know are not correct, but... Gotcha. I just don't know if I made a mistake somewhere through here. Yep. I cannot figure this one out. Okay. Uh, Rick, can you do me a favor? Can you fax that one to um, my room here? Sure. Okay, that one is, uh, my fax number is, I think, 908. Yeah, 908. Fax that one through, and then I'll have a look at it, and then show you where things maybe went astray. Okay. Okay. Okay, Rick, here we go. <coughs> Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit here. Hold on, let me zoom out a little. Okay, Rick, can you can you see where I'm at? I'm at your problem set here, and yep. this. Okay, so I'm good with this line here. <clears throat> what happens down here is this guy here, because what you're saying is 0.2 times line one add to line three. So I agree with this, and I agree with this, but this number here I disagree with because. What this is, is 320 times 0 0.2. That's 0 0.2 times that line, plus 150. Now 320 times, whoopsie daisy, sorry about that. Uh, 320 times 0 0.2 is 64. So 64 plus 150 is 214. So this guy down here needs to be 214. I think I multiplied by 110. Ah, ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, 32, yeah, that's what you did. Okay? Uh, and then if you change that, I'm hoping the rest of it will work out okay. Thank you. All right. I'm going to um, get something together and show people um, a way you can check some of this stuff on the internet. And uh, let me just get that set up, and then that will also help with problems like this because it will enable you to kind of figure out maybe where you went wrong. All right? So let me work on that for a second here. So, um... If, now what I'm going to do is go to, where am I going to go? The computer, okay? So here is uh, my computer screen. So I go to Google, and what you can do is type in algebra, or linear algebra, I should say. Linear, A-L, algebra, and then toolkit. Linear algebra toolkit, okay? And if you go to the linear algebra toolkit, can people see that? It's not the best screen. It's kind of hard to see. But what I've typed in here in Google is the Linear Algebra Toolkit. And so then you go to it. And then you get to this Linear Algebra Toolkit main page. And the thing that's most interesting is transforming a matrix to reduced row echelon form. That's R-R-E-F. That's that whole operation. So we click on this. Okay. And so then what you can do, and Rick will go through the problem that you were having. Okay, and so what we'll do is, uh, Rick had this particular problem. Uh, let's go to this overhead, mm, here. Here was, um, 
Rick's uh, system of equations. And then what he did is he can put it into a, uh, a matrix, an augmented matrix. That's that step there. So what you can do here is if you look at this augmented matrix, right, here's your A and here's your B. And you see that your A is a 3 by 3 matrix, and you see the B has just got three components to it. So if you look at your whole augmented matrix, it's got three rows and it's got four columns. One, two, three, four columns. So what you can do in this uh, toolkit is say it says the number of rows. Well, in this case, we had three rows. The number of columns was four. Okay, does that make sense to everybody so far? Okay, so you submit the number of rows and columns, and then what it does is it provides you the number of rows and columns in box form. So you can come along here now and put in your numbers. And so you see here the number is 1. What is that? Minus 0.2. Uh, minus 0.3. 320. <coughs> minus 0 0.1. Whoopsie daisy, it wasn't minus 0 0.1, it was minus 0 0.1. There we go. Minus 0 0.1, 1, minus 0 0.4, 1, minus 0 0.4, 90. And down here, minus 0 0.2, uh, minus 0 0.5, 1 and 150. Okay, so there you have your, whoops, oh, I'm sorry. Yell at me when I'm not when you're not seeing something that I'm not doing. I'm sorry. So what you did is when uh, when I put it, actually I don't think everybody got to see what I just did. Oh, this is weird. This is not centered on the. Uh, that's odd. I don't know why it's not centered on the computer screen exactly, but nonetheless, what happens is it comes back and asks you for the the number of rows and columns, and so what you do is go through and enter it into here, and then you say submit. Oh, don't worry about this. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Error. Oh, oh, okay. Actually, that's why it wouldn't work on this one. All right. So uh, you'll see here that make sure all the entries are integers or fractions. Decimal points are not allowed. So actually, in that particular one, we can't actually put in decimals. That's right. If you take everything and you multiply it by 10, then it will actually still give you the right answer. Because taking an augmented matrix and multiplying every element by 10 doesn't change anything. Okay, because why it doesn't change anything, just so you can see this. If you have um, your augmented matrix is AX equal to B. Now, if you just multiply this side by 10 and this side by 10, you get 10AX equals 10B. It doesn't change your X at all. So you can actually multiply, as long as you multiply everything through by 10, it won't make any difference. So if we now go back to our computer, okay, so if I multiply everything here by 10, so it's 10, and that would be minus 2, and that would be minus 3, and that would be 3,200, and that would be minus 1, and that would be 10, and that would be minus 4, and that would be 900, and that would be minus 2, and that would be minus 5, and that would be 10, and that would be 1500. Zero, zero. Now there's no decimals. I can submit it. And what it goes through, I don't know if you can see here, but it goes through... Let me just shrink this page a little bit. All of the various row operations that the computer did to figure out your answers. Uh, if you can see that going through there. And finally coming up with your answer down here. Okay. So what I would suggest is you can use this as a tool to check what's going on. What I really like about this is the fact that it actually takes you through all the various steps and it keeps the fractions there for you. Okay? Of all the ones that I've seen, I mean, on, you know, probably on your calculator you can do some of this, but what's really nice about this is it allows you to really look at where you maybe have made a mistake. Now the deal is this does it its own way. You know how you get choices? I can do this or I can do this. Um, this particular process I think follows what the book does and what I suggest the most closely. In other words, it always tries to get, you see here how it's got like 49 over 5? What it will try to do is make that 49 over 5 into a 1 straight away before it deals below. In other words, this 
process here follows exactly what I've been teaching you how to do these problems. You see, there are kind of quick ways that you can do things that I haven't been teaching you. I've been teaching you more of a systematic approach. And part of the reason is for that is because when you come to things like that, that are systematic, it makes it very easy to see where maybe you've made a mistake. Okay? Now, in the test, you're not going to have access to this. So my advice is don't rely on it. But the way, the, what I would do is say, this is a way you can check your answers to see if you've got them right or not. And these are particularly helpful, and let's just go back. Like, for example, um, when you want to invert matrices, right? So if you want to do a uh, matrix inversion, you know, like you've got the matrix, you know, 3, 2, 1, 1, right? And you want to find its inverse. The way you find its inverse is by setting this equal to I2, right? So that's 3, 2, 1, 1. And then you set up an augmented matrix like this. What's really nice about this is you can come in here and basically check that you've got your answer. Because I often found that when I do these things, I often make mistakes with these guys. There's somehow there's like double the chance of making a mistake because of these extra columns. So what you can do is, let's say I'm trying to find out what X is, and I have to take this and I have to find the, the row reduced echelon form of this augmented matrix. Then what I can do is I can come back to the computer and say, well, okay, it has, well, let's go back, sorry a bit. How many uh, rows do I have? I have two rows. And how many columns do I have? Four columns. Okay. Two rows, four columns. I come back to the computer. Number of rows is two. Number of columns is four. I submit it. I come in here. I go three, two, one, zero. I go one, one, zero, one. I submit. And bang. Out comes your answer right away. Down here. Okay, and I can go back to the overhead. So now I can actually write this down, just reading off that computer screen. 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, minus 2, minus 1, 3. And then that will actually give me my A inverse right there. Okay, so my advice is use this for checking purposes. Um, and then that way you can figure out where you've made a mistake. And I think, uh, Rick, for yourself, something like that would have been really helpful, right? That would have saved a lot of time. That would have saved a lot of time. So um, you can use that from here on in. As I said, what I want to do is I kind of don't like to introduce it right at the beginning because then people just want to go straight ahead and just use it, and then that doesn't help you in the tests. So my advice is um, uh, do it properly. Just use it as a tool to help check what you're doing. Okay. And as we go through the course, we're doing a lot of these you know, R you know, ref things. So it's nice to have something that just checks that that part of it is right for you, okay? But in the first test, what we're really trying to check is, do you know how to matrix, uh, manipulate matrices, add, multiply, all the rest? And then can you do this R ref thing, okay? And solve systems of equations and matrix equations. That's what the first test is all about. Okay, any questions about using that and how that works? This particular, this linear algebra toolkit thing, this is the best thing I've ever seen because I've never seen anything that um, really takes you through and says, this is what you did, and puts it in English, right? I mean, that's often the problem with these things, is they don't often put them in English. Whoa. Hold on a sec. Oh, okay. I lost, I lost you out there, Rick. Okay, so that's what I really like about this. It puts it in English. It keeps the fractions for you. It's about the best one I've ever seen that's out there, so, um, you know, give that a shot. Most of them out there just say, Oh, here's your input, here's your output. And they don't really help you debug what's going on. Okay? All right, good. Anybody else got any uh, questions at this stage? Rick, you're good. Dawn, are you doing all right over there? Okay. Michelle, you doing okay? Did you get your stuff scanned in? Yes, I sent it to you. Okay, I'll have a look. Thank you. Okay, how are we doing here in Fayette? Good? Okay. Procedure unknown. Okay, so this is problem set number three. Number one, four, mm -hmm. is that correct? Okay. Um, let me just have a look and see what that problem. 
is number three, okay. Okay, so this is finding the matrix of a linear transformation. Is that what you're, mm -hmm. that one? Okay. Alrighty, and then what does the book say? Let's have a look. This one here? Yeah. Okay, find the matrix of the linear transformation. Oh, okay. All right, so what the, the matrix is then is um, you would simply write this as AX. In other words, right, which is I think what you've got there. That's what you do. Yeah. In other words, here you've got, let me go to the color pencil. So Y1 equals 9X1 plus 3X2 minus 3X3. Y2 is equal to 2X1 minus 9x2 plus x3, blah, 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 like that. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you write this as the y, that's the vector, mm -hmm. and then this would be 9, 3, minus 3, 2, minus 9, 1, times x1, x2, x3, mm -hmm. which I can write as my matrix times exactly. x. And so what this is saying then is, so this is a, which is what you've got, Right, that's your a there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so y equals a x. What this is like is um, in functions you say y is f of x. Mm -hmm. so, here it's t, yeah. so here, because these are not one dimensional anymore, it's y is a function of x variable, but you don't call it an f anymore, you call it a t. Okay. And so what happens then is you can see now that um, that's y. And so what t of x is, is this. So t of x, your transformation is a of x. So all I need to write is whatever. All you need is that, yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to do here is kind of go through kind of step by step. how you would see it in your mind. Right. I mean, I can just tell you uh, right. it's just that. And that's what's confusing, I think, is yes. we've been working with that, which is fine. Yes. But now we're just kind of calling it. A transformation now. Right. Exactly. And he, here's the way that, and this is actually kind of, you know, if any, anybody's around and, and interested in this idea, um, when you're talking about the matrix of a linear transformation, I, I, let me just try to get some kind of ideas out there to mm -hmm. kind of help you. Um, let's go back to numbers, single numbers again. Mm -hmm. Okay. With single numbers, let's look at this notation. So f of x is 3x plus 5. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> This is commonly what we'd write down, and typically most people would think that what this means is this function is 3x plus 5. It, technically, this is not exactly right, and okay. what, what happens is this is where what you can do with numbers, it can give you a certain amount of slop and leeway, mm -hmm. but when you go to something more complicated, you start having to really right. distinguish between nuances. So he, here's the deal. What this is is the following. What you do is you think of this as here's the real number input and here's your real number output. Okay? You give me an x input. Right? And then what happens is the function acts and gives you another number output. Okay. And what that other number output is is f of x. Okay. So what I'm saying is x is a number and f of x is also a number but it's the output number, mm -hmm. and this is the input number. Okay. So. It's a domain image. Yeah, right. But, but these are specific values you put in, and f of x is the specific value that comes out. Okay. All right. The only, and, and so you, then the only thing is, this here is just simply the rule for how you calculate what this output is. Okay. In other words, technically, f of x is not really equal to 3x plus 5. It, what it is, is f of x is equal to whatever that number was that came out when you put x in. Okay. What this says is that how you calculate what that number is, is you do 3x plus 5. So you could almost think about this as being the word f of x equals the way you calculate it is 3x plus 5. 
but it really, it, it's, you really shouldn't think of it like that. You should think of x input, f of x is the output number. Okay. And then what this says is the way you calculate it is 3x plus 5. Okay. All right. Now with that, you can now actually see with vectors how this works. Because with vectors, right, you have x input, right, and then this is the uh, domain space, and then you have the range space, the stuff that it goes to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have, let's do, this is my input vector, and under the transformation, then this goes to, I don't know, some output vector that comes out over here. And this output vector over here is what I call t of x. So what I'm trying to do is show you the analogy between here. So here you have x is a vector input, and t of x is your vector output. Okay, just like f of x and just like x. Now, then you can also write down that t of x equals a of x, like that. Whoopsie, don't, don't need that. But what this is, is saying the way you calculate it is taking a matrix and multiplying it by x. It's not actually what t of x is. t of x is just the vector. You give me vector in, 1, 2, 3, and then whatever the vector is that comes out, 1, 5, 7. That's what t of x is. Just in the same way f of x is here, what this t of x equals to a times x, that's how you calculate it. Just like okay. here, how you calculate it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Ho hopefully that kind of, that makes then your original question a little bit more clear because what's happening here is when you write down, you know, y is equal to a of x like mm -hmm. this. This is what, you originally had a set of equations and then you come down to this. What this is really saying is y really is t of x. Okay, so if you want to write this down, what you're really saying is t of x is equal to a of x. And this is more in the lines of this is how you calculate what the output vector is. Here's your input vector. How do you figure out your output vector? This is how you calculate it. It's a times x. Okay. I don't know if that kind of, I, I know that was a little bit long-winded. No, yeah, it helps. Uh, it, it's, yeah, I don't know why it's. But, but I mean, I got that, so mm -hmm. it made sense, and I was obviously thinking about it correctly, so. Yeah, the, as I said, the, the way to think about it is that this is a calculation identity, mm -hmm. saying that t right. of x is a times this, and that, that yeah. And that's my a. Yeah, and there's your, and, and so then this is the matrix that represents what that transformation is. Okay. Um, in other words, when they say represents, it's, uh, this is the matrix that you need to do to you, calculate right. it, okay? Just like in our 1D, f of x has, that's right, has nothing to do with actually that it's 3x mm -hmm. plus 5. It is whatever the rule is that assigns this number to this number. The way you happen to do that for any number is this, you know? And okay. that, that's the analogy there. Okay. Okay. So the next one was six, and it asked, is this transformation linear? And I said no. Oh, okay, good. Okay, so let's go through this. This is problem set number three, and it's asking page 50, number six. And it's got a transformation, T of x1, x2. So here's your input vector. That's x, right? Mm -hmm. And what this notation is saying is, and, and I don't really like this notation, but it's saying t acting on this. So it could just be t of x. You t of x. x, yes, like that. Okay. okay. It's saying that t of x, and yet again, the statement in your book, this one down here, t of x is really saying this is how you calculate it. Okay. okay. So this is t of x is given by, you take x1 times this vector, 1, 2, 3, plus x2 times this vector, 4, 5, 6. So could you just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, x, is that? 
Right. Well, same thing. is it the same? Well, no, no, that, that's fine, but that's a good question, right? So, okay, so Michelle has asked, is this the same as this? Okay. Mm -hmm. So what I would do here when you have a question like that is, it's a good question, go through the steps of algebra to see if you can answer that. So what I would do here is the following. In other words, what this has said is, here's my calculation rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, X is my input, and remember X here is a two-dimensional X1, X2. If you put in a certain X, you get out this. So what I would do is just carry on calculating. So this is actually 1 times X1, 2 times X1, 3 times X1, plus 4 times X2, 5 times X2, 6 times X2, okay? which is 1X1 plus 4X2, 2X1 plus 5X2, 3x1 plus 6x2, okay? And so now the question is, that you had asked, is does this equal 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6 times x1, x2? So now you can answer that question. Is All I'm trying to say is that it's a guess mm -hmm. and it, it probably will work. Let's mm -hmm. see if it actually does. Well, let's have a look over here. So this is 1x1 plus 4x2, 2x1, x1 plus 5x2, well you can see that mm -hmm. it is working, okay? okay. So uh, to answer your question, yes, yes okay. okay, that um, yes, this is 1, 4, 2, 5, 3, 6 times x. So here you have t of x is equal to that, okay? And this is a x, like that. And there's your matrix that tells you how to calculate your output. Here's your output, here's your input vector. And um, uh, is it a linear transformation? It is linear because it can be represented as a matrix times a vector. So the only way it wouldn't be linear is if you had something like t times something, 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 if you had a free variable? Well, yeah, let me come back to that in a second. Now, someone, did someone send me a fax? Is that, Dawn, was that? I just did, did it come through? Um, it, it's thinking right now, let me, yep, it's coming through, so that's good, thanks Dawn. Yep. Okay. Is that two-sided then? Oh, it'll only come out one-sided. Did you put on front and back? I did, so I'll send the back side. The back side of it, yep. Well, I think, I'm guessing, yeah, that's probably what happened. Uh, yeah, it's only coming out one-sided, so my guess is, yeah, do the back side of everything as well. Okay. All right, Michelle, where were we at? So okay. I said, how is, when is it not linear? Uh, when it's not linear. And I said, when it has free variables is what I'm guessing? Uh, this wouldn't have free variables. You're saying something like R? Right. Yeah, that wouldn't. No. Yeah, the, I agree, that would not be linear. That would not be so something. that's what I would look yeah. for. Is it has well, more importantly, what you'd look for is something like this, AX plus, say, 3, 2, 1, or 3, okay. 2. The moment it is a matrix times your input vector plus some offset, okay. it is not going to be linear anymore. I think that's sort of what I was thinking there, but mm -hmm. when I wrote it out. Uh, uh, let me show you, I mean, Michelle, you asked a very good question is, when is a function or a transformation not linear? Right, that's really one mm -hmm. of the questions you're asking. And it's like, well, okay, what do I mean by linear? Okay, in one with single numbers, with single numbers, what does linear mean? Linear means, now, this is where in single numbers, we actually are using misnomers, <laughs> okay? Um, linear means f of ax equals a of f of x, 
and then f of a plus b equals f of a plus f of b. Okay. Okay. In 1D numbers, the function has to go through the origin. Oh, no, that doesn't look like it. So in 1D, it has to be f of x has to be through the origin to be linear. Okay. Now that's not normally what we call linear. What we call linear in 1D is maybe f of x equals say 3x plus 2, mm -hmm. right? And we think of this as a linear function. Mm -hmm. But let me show you, that the way we define what a linear function is, is it has to satisfy these two properties. Okay. So let's just have a look at this function here, which in math we normally call linear. a linear function. Why? Because that's to the power of 1. As long as it's the first degree, we're okay. So let's have a look. Now that's beeping at me. Hold on a sec. It might be saying it's out of paper. Yep. No paper. All right. Hold on a second. No, I don't think, I mean, I've gone, I've had like, I perceive this and that. It's oh, well, maybe that. Maybe that was more. Yeah. My gosh. Okay. I'm going to have to charge you guys for a ream of paper. Yep. That's fine. Well, we can bring stuff down if you want. Yeah. To why don't you just bring your own? Okay. Because you're going to be going through like yeah. a half a ream. Yeah. <laughs> We've got lots of work to do. Thank you. Yeah. We got you guys working hard. Let's have to quit around paper. <laughs> okay, all right, so sorry about that. I had to just, so Dawn, we're just kind of getting paper issues sorted out, but I think your fax is coming through now. Okay, so that I'll write that down to remind myself. Okay, okay, so let's have a look at, um, this function here is what we'd normally call a linear function with numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if it satisfies these properties. So f of ax is 3 times ax plus 2, which is equal to, if I pull the a out the front, I get a 3x and then plus 2. But you see, I can't write this down as a times 3x plus 2. Mm -hmm. That's not equal to that. So it's actually not linear in the way that in this class we call linear, linear. Okay. Okay, in other words, and the reality of it is that what's right is this class's definition of linear. Okay. What's wrong is elementary algebra's definition of linear. Okay. Okay, because linear really does mean that. You, you has these two properties, that if you... Um, you, you put an A in there, it comes out the front. Or if you do A plus B, you can do the individual ones and then do it afterwards. Okay. And so um, what that actually means is, and, and uh, this is just awkward because mm -hmm. I don't know how to say to you, quit thinking, uh, quit thinking mm -hmm. that because that's what everybody gets taught. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that's not what linear really means. Linear is pretty mathematically clear. It means this. So then the question is, if I'm telling you that 3x plus 1 is no longer a linear function, what are linear functions with just numbers? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then an equation to the first degree has no name? Or you just 
it's a first line? no it's a first degree polynomial okay okay so really what this is is p1 of x it's a polynomial of no more than first degree okay, okay now i have to answer that facts okay that's coming on through all right okay so yeah the, the way i would call this function is it's a polynomial of degree one or less okay that's what that guy is all right so the question then is in 1d you know functions of single variables what is a linear function well a linear function is goes only goes through the origin because okay. you see if f of x equals 3x let's see that it satisfies these properties so f of ax equals 3ax which is a 3x which is a f of x that satisfies the first property then f of a plus b is equal to 3 times a plus b which is 3a plus 3b and um, f of a plus f of b okay so yeah this is kind of what makes a little bit of this class awkward mm -hmm. is that the notation and the language you have been using is actually technically not correct okay okay um so it's not helpful to think of a linear equation in there it isn't <laughs> because you think of it, it, it's close linear equations that go through the origin you're good okay. ones that don't you're not so good anything offset again which is anything offset is not linear and that's why when you ask me the question t of x when i write it down as a of x that to me is linear now let me show you how i look at this in 1d i see f of x equal a x oh no not like that <laughs> where this is just a number mm -hmm. like five or seven mm -hmm. so you can see how you can, rewrite it. you can rewrite everything as just going into vectors mm -hmm. okay and so then how would this function not be linear the moment i add an offset to it okay how would this vector equation not be linear the moment i add something to it like that I think that's what was confusing me here because I was thinking it was another. I, I was thinking like this was B, it AX plus B, but that's not right. Right, okay. So, yeah, let me just. That is go not ahead. the offset. Yeah, yeah. It's just another variable. Well, the thing is, is what if it were a B, it would be just 3, 2, 1. It would be a constant with no with variable out front. Okay. With the variable in front, it it's changes okay. everything. Okay. It, well, it, it's not okay. It's not okay. <laughs> I could put variable r here, and you see how this is x1 and x2, and there could be an r here? Okay. Then this certainly wouldn't be linear either, okay. because there's some other variable here that doesn't depend on what your original x so vector is. So that would be is. a free variable. That yeah. could be a free variable, yes. Okay. We're just generally never going to run into this. Okay. Okay, so, <laughs> don't worry um, so don't worry about it too much. But the, the key idea here is, that. Is, is really this, is that in linear algebra, what we're actually dealing with is functions that are ax. We're really deal dealing with the very simplest functions that you'd ever think of. 3x or, you know, 5x or whatever it was, you know. Okay. Minus x, except now this and everything here becomes vectors. So this becomes x, f becomes a transformation, and then the, the 3 becomes a vector. But, I mean, a matrix now. Okay. And, and that's how, if you can think about it like that, then actually almost everything starts to make much more sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I know it doesn't it, seem it, like it. Well, I see now. Just yeah. that offset is what would make it not linear. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Which, of course, is unfortunate. And so, uh, you know, one of the things I would always say is you've always got to be careful about what um, your textbooks, your math textbooks at high school are going to tell you. Mm -hmm. Um I just be you always have to really be careful about it mm -hmm. you know what I mean um, and uh, but the reality is none of us are going to change calling a function linear. 3x plus 5 we're always going to call that linear mm -hmm. right I mean th th it's so ingrained with people mm -hmm. even though it's actually not linear and <laughs> the only so then I guess yeah. if you run into the thing where that's linear then you have to Yes. Make them rethink about it. Yes, yeah. It's only here when you get to matrices, but this is the whole point of this, which is now you're actually starting to really understand more about single numbers by looking at something a little bit more complicated. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I, I don't know if that explains some I of those so. ideas. I okay. think it helped. It Good. definitely helped. Okay. Um, going on to... 
Hold on, let me just do a quick check around and see how everybody's doing. Uh, let me come back to here. Okay, Dawn, everything going okay there for you? I'm good. Okay, good. Rick, you doing all right there? Any questions? Um, I actually just had one question about the an an answer on the practice test for letter G. Okay. I don't know if you guys talked about that uh, one or not. Okay, Michelle, let me uh, let me come back and answer that question. Uh, we'll, we'll go and answer that one. Okay. Uh, alrighty. So let me push that. Did I? Was I recording this? I think I was, so that's good. Okay. Uh, on the practice test, G. Okay. Whoopsie daisy. Let me get the overhead. This one here. Oh, okay. Hold on. Let me... G is minus one, two, minus four, one, two, mm -hmm. Oh, okay, good question, Rick. Okay, so, um, yeah, everybody can see this one. So this is for question G, that when you do M dot P, uh, the M and the P, are they're, they're not transformed, right? Like, M... If m was a, uh, a column vector times a row vector, then you could kind of multiply this out and it would all work. But m dot p says, I don't care whether you're a row vector or a column vector. You just simply multiply the first two components together, the second two, the third two, and then add them up. In other words, okay, I have this, whoopsie daisy, uh, wrong thing. Sorry, there we go. I have m dot p. And what's m? m is 1, minus 1, 2, minus 4, dot p, which is 1, minus 2, 4. It doesn't actually matter that they're row, row, a row vector, or a column vector, or a column vector, or a row vector. The only thing that's really important is that they're vector, vector. That's what the dot product does. The dot product says, I don't care. I don't care if you are a row or column vector. They only want vector, vector. Because you see, whether it's a row or a column vector, the first and the first is well defined, so you don't really care, okay? So, um, so what happens here is you just simply go minus one times minus, uh, minus one times one, plus this times this, 2 times minus 2, and then this times this. And then you add that up, and that's how you calculate it. Um, so, uh, Rick, does that kind of help you out there? Yes, it does. I was thinking the dot product, you always transpose the first one, but it doesn't matter then. It's just y vector yeah. vector. Yeah. For, in matrix multiplication, you absolutely need to have the right, you know, the, it this way and this way. You know what I mean? You need to have the rows and columns working correctly. What the dot product does is the dot product can be written as a matrix multiplication as long as you've got it right, but it also doesn't have to be. And that's the specific thing about the dot product. The dot product says, I don't care whether it's a row or column vector coming in, just as long as you give me two vectors, I know how to work out the answer. So you can imagine that the dot product is kind of less sensitive than matrix multiplication in that way, okay? The, the thing is about the dot product, all it needs is that you've got to have two vectors that are the same size. You can't have one with three components and one with two. That's not going to work. That's actually why, in some sense, why we actually even use the dot product is because it doesn't matter whether you've written them as rows or columns. You're just saying, whatever the vectors are, I'm going to do whatever. Whereas with matrices, bec because the deal with a matrix, right, is that, if you have a matrix like this, one, two, three, one, two, three, something like that, these two matrices, well, this will work with matrix, if considering vectors as matrices, this will work, but this won't work if you consider them as matrices. If you consider them as a dot product, that works, and that works. It's just kind of a less sensitive way of making sure that you can do things. And for that reason, in some ways, I, I am a little more reticent about the dot product 
because it, it can, it doesn't make you formally keep doing the same thing each time. Do you know what I mean? And it can be a little bit confusing. Um, but if you're sensitive to that and you kind of know it, you're good to go. Right, hopefully that answers your question. Yep, that helped. Okay, good, thank you. All right, um, let me just go back to Michelle. Michelle, you doing all right there? Yes, I'm doing fine. Okay, good, okay. Okay, so Michelle, back here in uh, Fayette. What question did you have now, I guess? Page 50, number 42. I guess I don't even understand what I'm supposed to be doing with that one. Whoopsie daisy. Okay. This one here? Mm-hmm. Okay. I drew a picture. Let me try to zoom in here. Okay. When you represent a three-dimensional object graphically in the plane, on paper, the blackboard or a computer screen, you have to transform the spatial coordinates, x1, x2, x3. Oh, okay, so every point in real space has three numbers to it. Okay. Um, and you have to transform it into just two. Okay. Okay, so, um, all right, good, this is a good question. So, uh, how can I do this? Let me see if I can do it this way. So, let's imagine we've set up coordinate systems, right? Here's the x direction, here's the y direction, and my head is going to be z, mm -hmm. okay? So let's say um, that microphone over there, okay? That microphone over there is a point. Okay. And so I can draw a vector. It's going, you know, I don't know, two feet in this direction, in the x1 direction, three feet in the x2 direction, and maybe minus one foot in the z direction. So I would represent that microphone over there by x is equal, will we say, 2, 3, minus 1. Mm -hmm. That's what that microphone would be. But now, if someone were to come along and view this room on a computer screen, mm -hmm. which actually <laughs> everybody is actually doing who's not in this room, they are now viewing, for example, now, right? When they're looking at this computer screen, this is what they're seeing, right? And let's say there's the, there's the microphone over there. Mm -hmm. Okay, actually I think that's that one over there. So we'll just save a bit, it's that one there. Okay, good, yeah, I'm pointing to the right direction. Let's say that this is the vector for that microphone. Okay. The reality is we look at the screen and we think of the screen as being three-dimensional, but it's not really, it's actually two-dimensional. Where is that micro microphone on the screen? Well, where, and I don't know how to do this, um, like if this were just an X and a Y? If this were just an X and a Y, that's X. So you say like minus two, minus three. Yeah, hold on, let me go to this. Let me zoom out. Okay, yeah. So if this were X and this were Y, this is kind of as good as I can do, I think, for this. Mm -hmm. So here's an X and a Y. The microphone, when we originally had it, this microphone would be something like minus three, minus two. That would be the Y position of it. Okay, so let's go back to the overhead and zoom in. So its Y position would be something like minus three, minus two. Okay. It, so somehow you need to be able to, when you have a three-dimensional room and you want to put it onto a, a screen, you have to know how to go from here to here. So therefore, we're assuming there's a transformation that will do that. And this is exactly how computer games work, right? You know in a computer game, in a 3D computer game, how you have, you know, there's a tank over there about to blow you up or something, right? And so you run forward. Well, the reality is it looks like you're in 3D, but really you're only on a 2D screen. And so what they have to do in the computer is they say, hey, this is the position of the tank, okay? How do I draw that in terms of an XY coordinate? What pixel gets illuminated on my screen? They have to figure out what this transformation is. Okay. And then as you move, this transformation changes. Mm -hmm. 
because as you get further into the room or further out from the room, how this position of the tank relative to its coordinates changes on the screen. Okay. This is what this is about, okay? okay. Uh, so I think that was your first question, yep. which is what is, yeah, the yeah. what is it even asking me, right? So I think that was the first question, mm -hmm. okay? So hopefully that's kind of what's going on. And you don't tend to think of it like this. Mm -mm. Because when you see a 3D diagram, like on, a t uh, like on the TV screen that you're looking at right now, right? When you're looking at any of these um, TV screens, you think of them as 3D. Mm -hmm. But they're not. They're actually only 2D. Okay. Right? And you could do that, right? Because we could play magic tricks where, you know, I could have something that... Um, I, I could do a magic trick where I could take maybe a, a photo of you and shrink it down and then I could put it on this TV screen and it would look like um, that we could actually, how can I say this, it could look like we could actually be the same size and go through each other, except because it's 2D, mm -hmm. we're actually not. If I change the size of you and then put it on the screen, nobody would know the difference of that because it would look like you were either closer to the camera or further away from the camera. Yet in reality, you're smaller and closer or bigger and further away. Yes. Good point. Right, on pictures. That's a very good way of looking at it. Yep. Okay. So uh, this is what this is about. Okay. Okay. That helps. Okay. So now, wh what they're saying is when you represent a three-dimensional object, let's go over to the overhead. When you represent a, a three-dimensional object graphically in the plane, you take these coordinates and you've got to put them into X and Y, okay. which is the two. Um, they're giving you an example here of what you can do. Use this transformation to represent the unit cube with corner points this. Okay, so let's just go through this example. Okay, so they've given you a transformation. Uh, let me get a clearer piece of paper here, maybe. Oh, I guess it doesn't. So my T of X is A of X, is A of X, and the A matrix is minus one half, one, zero, minus one half, zero, one, times X. Now X here, by the way, is x1, x2, x3, like that. Okay. Okay. And you notice how this is a three, sorry, a two by three matrix multiplied by a three by one matrix. Mm -hmm. You're going to get out a two by one matrix, which okay. makes sense. You're going to get the x y coordinates out. All right. So here are the. They've given you the points of the cube. Now I'm going to try to obviously draw this in 3D. Of what are the corners of a cube? A unit cube. So I'm going to put one here, one here, one up here, minus one back here, minus one here, and minus one under there. Okay, there's my coordinates. Mm -hmm. So the points on my cube are, so here we go, a zero, zero, so that's one. X is one, zero, zero, that's another one. So this is a vector one, zero, zero, right? That's that going out there. And then another one is. 0, 1, 0, so that means 0 in the x1 direction, 1 out in this direction and none up and down, so that's out to here. This is 0, 1, 0, can you? Yep. Okay, and you can see how all the rest of them, there's this point 0, 0, 1, which would be up here, mm -hmm. and then there'll be another one over here, and there'll be another one over here, and then there'll be another one here and another one here, making your cube. So each one of those vectors represents that cube. Okay. Except these are vectors in real space. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the question is, you're going to transform those vectors to figure out what it looks like in 2D, x1, x2, how you would draw that cube in 2D to get a perfect perspective. Okay. Okay. What does this part represent this image in your figure? Why do you want it? Oh, because what, what they're going to do here is they're going to give you some point out like this, this vector, and they're going to say, well, when that vector points in this way, what does it look like in 2D? For example, um, if in 3D, like let's imagine this was my origin right here. Mm -hmm. Let's imagine I had this vector pointing out over here like this. Okay. If you were to now look at it on that screen over there, what would that thing look like in 2D? In other words, I haven't got... Just trying to think if I had some, is there anything in here that's kind of a long, like a ruler or something? They don't have rulers. Um, for, for example, 
let me show you this vector here. If I had this vector that went from here out to here, mm -hmm. okay, looking at it from the computer screen, here in this room, you can see that this is a vector that has this length mm -hmm. and starts here and ends here. Mm -hmm. On the computer screen, all you would see if I was perfectly square with the camera would be the dot okay. of my fingers, okay. right? It's asking you when you have something like that, what does it represent on 2D screen? Okay. And if it happens to be pointing in, what you may find is when you do the transformation on this vector, it may come out to be a dot. Mm -hmm. And okay. if it comes out to be a single dot, then what that means is you're actually looking along that direction. Okay. Uh, it's kind of weird, but that's... Yeah, I can see that. Totally. Okay. All right. And so um, it, this is actually the one thing I think that actually um, doing geometry over the ICN mm -hmm. is very, very challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm, I'm going to try to do my best, but it is very challenging to do that. Okay. Let me just hold on a second. Michelle, do you have a question for us there? No, I'm fine. I'm watching what you're doing. Oh, okay. All right. Good. Uh, and then everybody's good. Okay, good. Okay. So, all right. So what we're talking about here then is, let me go back to the overhead. Okay. Um, so in this problem then, we've got our cube here in 3D space. Mm -hmm. We're now trying to figure out if you take a cube, so it's basically you take a box. If I had a box sitting here like this, and then it was to be you know, if you were to look at it on the computer screen, basically up here or for folks off screen, what they're looking at right now, okay, w what would the XY coordinates of that box be? Okay, well, let's figure it out. So it's just simply the transformation. So what you do is you take the zero vector. What does the zero vector transform into? So T of zero, zero, zero. Well, then that is minus one half, one, zero, minus one half, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Well, we know what that's going to do. That's going to just give you zero, zero. Mm -hmm. That's easy. So the origin maps to the origin. Okay. That, that's the inside point, okay? okay? Now, let's take another point. Why don't, we take, why don't we take this far point up here? In other words, here's my cube. If here's my origin here, what's the diagonal one furthest away in that cube? Okay. That would be one, one, one. Right? That one there. Okay. Okay, so that's going to be minus one half, one, zero, Minus one half, zero, one, 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 one. Okay, so we'll multiply that together. It gives you minus a half plus one, which is a half, and zero. So that gives you a half, minus a half, zero, and one. That gives you uh, a half again, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what happens is on my cube, on my cube, if here's the origin down here, the point over here that's furthest away, the diagonal away in most, what would it look like on a 2D screen, like a television screen? Well, it would go to the point one half, one half. It would be up here. And what you're going to do is go through and draw all of these on here. And you'll find that when you do that, you'll end up with a cube that looks like this. You should actually see when you go through and put these points together, that you should actually see a 3D representation of a cube in 2D. Uh -huh. okay. That's what you should see. Okay, that's my hope. I haven't done this problem, but that's basically what you should see. I don't even yeah. know if my cube in 2D looks like a cube. <laughs> well, right, that, that's the trouble is, the real problem is we are drawing in 2D mm -hmm. to then look at how it would look in 2D. But what you'll do is, you know how you drew this, you drew this diagram by hand mm -hmm. and it looks kind of a little bit <laughs> funky, right? By doing this transformation, you're actually going to see exactly how it should look. Okay. Okay? And so then you'll actually realize, well, if I actually wanted to draw cubes by hand, the easiest way to do would be come up with my transformation and then, uh -huh. just, and then just draw it by putting the numbers in and doing it. So all those crazy things in Calc 3, we should just <laughs> transform. Uh, in Cal four, yeah, in three yeah, four yeah, whatever. that's right. Yeah, all those things you could just, if you had this transformation, you could write these things and put it in. Well, and you know how we used in Calc four, we used um, graphing software to draw graphs in three D. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. Hmm. Cool. All computer games. This is exactly what they do in computer games. They don't do anything different than this, right? They have a see. In other words, in a computer game, to the computer, the tank and the you know whatever it is, the building. It all is actually, th they tell you the edge points of all of these things. And then what the computer does is it takes all those points and use a transformation 
to convert it into a 2D diagram so it looks 3D and puts on your computer screen. And then what happens is, what changes in the computer is as you move, the transformation changes. Because if I take this 3D image in front of me, if I take this 3D room here in front of me, and I want to maybe project it onto a camera in 2D, I have one transformation.